the Trump of Architecture. The Queen of the Curve has been supplanted by the King of Free Market Libertarianism, and he's not holding back. Stark attacked, using his position as the figurehead of a globally recognized firm to propagate his personal views, sounding off on topics of which he often appears to have little grasp. His hour-long keynote speech at Berlin's World Architecture Festival went further in expounding his radical worldview than he had ever yet dared. A hugely controversial speech, his incendiary address, prompting incredulity, a stunned audience, embarrassing, jaw-dropping, speechless. Top architect blasts free riding tenants living in council houses in central London and says they should be moved to make way for his staff. Abolish social housing, scrap prescriptive planning regulations, and usher in the wholesale privatization of our streets, squares, and parks. Scrap art schools, privatize cities, and bin social housing. Railed against everything from state funded art schools to the PC takeover of architecture. So whether these out-of-touch comments were designed to shock or not, anyone who thinks abolishing affordable housing altogether, supporting buy-to-leave empty properties, and building on Hyde Park is the answer to London's housing crisis, doesn't understand the first thing about our great city. No appreciation that the housing market doesn't simply behave according to the pure logic of supply and demand. Given his well-known penchant for neoliberal economics, it was perhaps little surprise that his plan included a number of highly controversial ideas, such as the elimination of all forms of social housing and planning and the privatization of all public space. His uncompromising position on social housing estates provoked particularly audible disgust. Weeding out the poor. Pretty crude social engineering. Social engineering. Social cleansing. A fundamental faith in the power of the pure unbridled market to solve everything, from housing provision to employment regulation. Imagining a world where privatization is extended to streets, city management, and possibly even legal systems. Bah! It is a doctrine that, if ever implemented would lead to forms of tyranny and oppression that have few counterparts in human history. 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 These developments in turn have prompted an outcry from the architectural profession. But it is the comments on social housing that have provoked the most furious response. In response to the furor, rhetoric verges on post-truth territory. Untruthful ranting. Raging. We chose not to cover the speech, at least in part because the audible boos from the crowd indicated that this was not a position that the wider architectural profession was interested in giving publicity to. Hmm. A former Marxist, from the most distant fringes of the left to the extremities of the pro-corporate libertarian right. Radical right-wing libertarian. Lefty liberal conspiracy. Thatcher! Hayek! Uh, Anarchist! Capitalist! Anarcho-capitalist! Fascist! Anarcho! Fascist! An extremist blinded by ideology. Ideological extremist theories. Extreme views. Extreme! 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 Extreme. Provocateur. A political agitator. Self-styled contrarian. Arcane theorizing. Autopoiesis. Advancing social functionality via agent-based parametric semiology. The parametric tuxedo that he designed himself. Experimental furniture. Economically illiterate. Sheer market fundamentalism. Daring cutlery. Free market capitalism. Callous. Child labor. Clickbait. Dogmatic. Blockchain. Outrage. Anathema. The absurdity. It is time to stop listening to Patrick Schumacher. 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 Welcome to An Architecture, Episode 10. This is a second episode in our series about Patrick Schumacher, the head of Zaha Hadid Architects. In the last episode, episode number 9, we introduced Patrick 
and gave a summary of a presentation that he had given talking about the housing market and how government interventions distort the housing market and are restricting possibilities for creating more affordable housing in city centers like London. And Patrick's presentation got quite a response from the architectural press as well as a few mainstream media outlets. So we wanted to spend this episode reviewing some of those responses and offering some criticism and defenses of Patrick's ideas. If you just want to hear what Patrick has to say, feel free to jump ahead to the interview I did with him, which is in the next episode, episode number 11. I thought it would be worthwhile to go through and review some of the articles that have been written in response to Patrick's speech to understand how these ideas have been perceived and communicated through the media to more of a mainstream audience. So Joe and I are going to run briefly through a handful of these articles and just kind of hit on some of the key points. And we've each picked an article out of the bunch to go through and evaluate further. I'd say the majority of articles that have been written have been negative or critical of Patrick's views, or usually just expressing outrage and astonishment at what he said. There have been a handful of more positive or supportive articles as well. We thought it would be worthwhile to respond to some of these criticisms, not just because we're, you know, kind of white knighting for Patrick. I don't think he needs us to speak for him. But because many of these arguments that people have raised, if you can call them arguments, many of the the objections that people have raised in a lot of these articles are very typical of the kinds of critiques that these kinds of libertarian ideas get all the time. So it's interesting for us to observe how the media responds to these kind of ideas, because frankly, they don't often even get publicized in the media. As I said in my article, if, if Patrick had been just some intern architect working in the back office of a big firm, He wouldn't have had the presentation in the first place, and it certainly wouldn't have gotten any media attention. In fact, one publication, Arc Daily, explicitly said when they finally got around to covering this, here's a quote, Though Arc Daily was in attendance at the lecture, we chose not to cover Schumacher's speech, at least in part because the audible boos from the crowd indicated that this was not a position that the wider architectural profession was interested in giving publicity to. So there you go. There's the standard of journalism that we're working with. Uh, Yeah, that's courageous journalism right there. You'd think that as a journalist, that when the crowd starts booing something, it's probably the time to start the recorder running. (laughs) (laughs) That's when things are just getting interesting. (laughs) Right. So it's a bit unusual for libertarians like us and like Patrick to have this kind of publicity for our views. And it's especially uncommon, I think, in the architectural profession. Because as Ark Daly just said, there seems to be a reticence to report views that challenge the status quo. I think the first article that really put this out there to a broader audience beyond the the architectural world uh, was a Guardian article in which Patrick was interviewed. So we're going to come back in a few minutes and review that and critique it a bit. Another article that brought this, I think, to a, a broader audience was London's Evening Standard. And the headline says it all here. Top architect blasts free riding tenants, with free riding in quotes, living in council houses in central London and says they should be moved to make way for his staff with his in all capital letters. (laughs) To some extent, that's the way journalism is over here. There's a lot more kind of opinion mixed in with with reporting (laughs) than I think we have in the United States, which I actually prefer. You know, I'd rather have it. I'd rather have the bias out front there so that I know how to uh, how to evaluate something. Yeah, wear it on your sleeve. (laughs) Right. So they went through and cherry picked a handful of quotes from his presentation and again, there wasn't a lot of criticism here. It's more just, can you believe that this guy said this? Yeah. <laughs> but they did get a response from the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. So this says, the comments sparked an angry response from Sadiq Khan, who described them as out of touch and just plain wrong. The mayor told the Standard, one of our biggest strengths as a city is our diversity, with Londoners from different backgrounds living side by side. So first of all, did, did Patrick say anything about diversity in his speech? Um, and let's see, I listened to, I think it was an hour and a half long. I don't think I heard anything about diversity or race. Yeah, and to give him the benefit of the doubt here, the mayor might be talking more about economic diversity. No, I don't, I don't think so. I think it's, there's a sort of heuristic that minorities tend to make up a bigger proportion of poor people. So therefore, anything that could possibly disadvantage poor people is inherently racist. And I disagree with this, but this is, I think, the implication that goes into that sort of a statement. Right. And I think that's the way that a lot of people have reacted to this is is looking at his comments about, as he said, eliminating social housing. And there's a lot of outrage, I guess, here about taking what are now existing social housing buildings and selling them to private hands for redevelopment. People use the phrase social cleansing (laughs) to describe this. 
where people are being, I guess, evicted or kicked out of these houses so that they can be be redeveloped. But that's that is no different than any other rental property. I mean, if you're renting a property, you don't own the property. I mean, they can when your lease term is up, the landlord can do whatever he wants with the property, right? <laughs> regardless yeah. of whether it's social housing or not. So this is not a radical statement to suggest that the owner of a rental property should be allowed to determine what's going to happen with it. Right. And again, Patrick did offer solutions that would bring in more affordable units into the city, such as allowing for smaller units within the space standards, as well as more out-of-the-box solutions like co-housing. And frankly, a lot of that goes on here as it is. We have a few friends here in the area, and it's not unusual for people, you know, even into their 30s, to be sharing a house with other people. Either they own the house and rent out a room, or, or they're renting a room from somebody else's house. So trying to find a way to systemize that and provide it at a larger scale within the city center could certainly bring a lot more affordability there without the need for subsidies. But even Patrick had said in his speech that he's not at this point proposing taking away all subsidy, that he would prefer to see what is now a housing subsidy replaced with a more general subsidy, essentially just a cash disbursement. A universal basic income or something like that? Yeah, maybe not universal, but maybe it's a means-tested. I mean, he didn't get into any of these details, but even just some kind of means-tested welfare payment. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The principle is that you're providing people cash to spend and prioritize the way that they want to, rather than inflating the housing market with an infusion of subsidies. And this is true of any market that government subsidizes. You know, we have we see university prices skyrocketing because governments fund student loans and grants. We see healthcare costs skyrocketing because the majority of money paying into the healthcare system, at least in the U.S., is from the government. It's over fifty percent. So when you have subsidies in a specific market, you start to get these kind of price distortions that prevent the market from achieving a more rational means of value discovery. So back to the mayor's comments, I think the implication here that Patrick was criticizing diversity is just a red herring. So he goes on, this is the mayor again. So whether these out-of-touch comments were designed to shock or not, anyone who thinks abolishing affordable housing altogether, supporting buy-to-leave empty properties, and building on Hyde Park is the answer to London's housing crisis, doesn't understand the first thing about our great city. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, this isn't an argument. This is just a dismissal and then some political posturing. You know, I mean, what do you expect from a mayor? So he goes on, I was elected as mayor because of my commitment to tackle the housing crisis. So how's that going? (laughs) (laughs) I know, and most Londoners agree, that this means building more new and affordable homes for Londoners to rent and buy and protecting our public square and parks. So it's all well and good to say that, building more new and affordable homes for Londoners. But as Patrick pointed out, it's not just about building more homes, it's about building the right types of homes, and building a mix of homes, building a different unit mix, that would allow for the kind of diversity that this guy claims to champion. (laughs) You know, as Patrick said, these housing standards almost exclusively result in middle-class homes or or homes that only the middle class can afford. And so they simply prohibit the kinds of houses that would allow for more affordability to come into city centers. So then he finishes by saying, I'll listen to any ideas people have about tackling the housing crisis, but in this case, Mr. Schumacher is just plain wrong. (laughs) If you say so. How magnanimous. (laughs) So that gives you a pretty good sense of the kind of comments that have been coming out in response to Patrick's speech. You know, there's a lot of kind of shock and astonishment, but not a lot of substantive argument. And in response to the mayor's speech, as well as some of the other publicity, the Zaha Hadid architect firm released an open letter. So it starts out, Patrick Schumacher's urban policy manifesto does not reflect Zaha Hadid architect's past and will not be our future. Zaha Hadid did not write manifestos. She built them. And the letter goes on in a similar vein. I don't want to sound like I'm knocking the firm or the positive comments that this letter has about Zaha Hadid, because I think we're in agreement that she was quite a visionary and and really had some amazing achievements in the field. But just the tone of the whole letter sounds to me like it's a lot of virtue signaling. There's a paragraph where they talk about how Zaha deeply believed in international collaboration, and we have an ethnically diverse team in our office. 43% of the architects are of an ethnic minority, and 40% of them are women. And again, Patrick didn't say anything in his speech about ethnicity, race, any of this stuff. Right. So this is just some knee-jerk thing where someone's made some assumption somewhere that his speech is going to be perceived as somehow racist. So now the firm feels that they're on the back foot and has to sort of 
put up their bona fides. Right. It's a pretty short letter, but really, as far as I can see, the main thrust of it is emphasizing the firm's promotion of diversity and inclusiveness. And, and I'm not knocking that. I think those are worthy goals, and I applaud the firm for having achieved that. But again, it's, it's this red herring where it's <laughs> that's not what the speech was about. It just seems like this kind of vapid PR speak virtue signaling. I don't know, Tim, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, when I first read this letter, I thought the same thing. But then I, I thought about it a little more. I said, you know what? This is actually kind of a smart response you know, from the firm because they managed to put themselves on the acceptable side of the controversy without actually criticizing Patrick other than the first line <laughs> that his manifesto does not reflect Zahadi's architect past or future, um, which isn't really saying anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's the same thing that Patrick has said, that his political theories are kept separate from the work. But apparently, after this letter had been sent out, there was a leaked email that came out from Patrick to the firm saying that that letter had been written by someone in the marketing department and hadn't been approved by the directors. So so it's not entirely clear how the firm and its directors have responded to this, at least not from that letter. But what did happen to the firm was that, I don't know for how long, but I think for a few weeks, they had protesters outside their office every day, you know, shouting down Patrick Schumacher, the evil libertarian. No, they weren't calling him a libertarian. They were calling him a fascist. Oh, fascist, of course. <laughs> yeah, the fascist who wants to get rid of government. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll take that fascist any day. <laughs> yeah, I read another interview with Patrick where he said that at one point these guys like chased him down the street. <laughs> and he was proud of himself for being able to run faster than them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had been on their feet all day, I guess, with those signs. It's hard work slinging mud. <laughs> But while there have been some very loud, critical voices, there have been a number of voices as well who have stepped up and defended Patrick. And a lot of these have done so in, in sort of a guarded fashion where they've said, oh, you know, his ideas are certainly worth considering. And I find his critiques of zoning to be worthwhile. However, I do think we need housing for poor people or something like that. <laughs> and there were some who would say, oh, well, I disagree with what he's been saying. However, I do welcome the lively conversation and support his right to say it. That sort of thing. Right. Or even some people are, are even kind of accepting of the na of the controversial nature of what he said, saying that, you know, it's it's good for us all to be to be shaken up a little bit from time to time. <laughs> However, I think an architecture has been the only voice in the architecture world that has openly championed everything Patrick has said. So as we said, we want to take two articles in particular and go through and pick them apart a little bit. To point out the nature of the, I guess, the rhetoric that's behind some of this media coverage, as well as to defend Patrick's ideas and libertarian ideas in general against the arguments that have been made within these articles, to the extent that arguments have been made. <laughs> the first article is the article that first brought Patrick to my attention. This was in The Guardian. It's by Oliver Wainwright. The article is dated November 24th, 2016, I think just a couple of days after Patrick's speech. The title is Zaha Hadid's Successor, Scrap Art Schools, Privatize Cities, and Bin Social Housing. And the translation of bin from English to American is trash, <laughs> in case you didn't pick up on that. And so the article starts, The extreme views of Patrick Schumacher, who has taken over at the global firm, Zaha Hadid, are causing outrage. His vision? Let the market rule and don't put equality before profit. When I first read this, I, I thought it was a pretty comprehensive article. That gives a fairly complete overview of, of Patrick's outlook. But of course, even on my first read, I could, I could sniff out a little bit of kind of misrepresentation. You know, I think that Wainwright, the author, is trying to, or at least thinks that he's giving Patrick a fair shake here. I think that he's, I don't think he's trying to be malicious. But as we go through it, we're going to try to show that this isn't exactly unbiased journalism. And again, I don't think this is a hit piece. I think he actually thinks Patrick is crazy. And he's gone through and cherry picked some sound bites uh, to confirm this bias. My first impression of the article was that it was a hit piece. However, after reading through it a, a few more times, I think I did soften up on it a little bit and gave him a bit more of the benefit of the doubt. But for example, there's a picture of Patrick in the article, and the caption is that he's wearing a parametric tuxedo that he designed himself, which to me, that sounded like a kind of a subtle jab, like, you know, this guy's so crazy, he designs his own clothes, and, and that's what he wears. Did you get that at all, Tim? I didn't think about that when I saw the picture, because Zaha Hadid architects, they're not just architects, they do product design and clothing design, fashion design. Right. I guess I didn't really think twice about it, but you're right. The fact that he's putting that up there, it, it really sets up the tone that we're going to describe through the whole article, which is that he's kind of elite and aloof and out of touch with the rest of us, and especially the people, for example, in social housing, 
that many people perceive as the targets of his, uh, of his criticisms. So the article starts with a series of kind of sensational descriptions of Patrick. And, you know, there's somewhat fair descriptions, but in general, there's a little bit of poisoning the well going on here, where he's framing this character of Patrick in certain terms. Yeah, in the first paragraph, it says that Patrick has provoked a flood of impassioned responses online with both opponents and supporters declaring him to be the Trump of architecture. Now, I haven't dug into this much. Have you seen any journalists or bloggers or, or articles where, where they've used that term? This was the first place I saw it, and I've seen a lot of other articles that have kind of referenced this article or that clearly were pulling material from this article, yeah. um, including that. So to me, that seems to be where this started. <laughs> My guess is that he found something on a comment feed somewhere, you know, on Facebook or, or who knows. On a YouTube comment thread. <laughs> yes, I'm sure that somebody out there on a comment called him the Trump of architecture, but <laughs> I haven't seen that in any of the other published articles about this um, other than the ones that reference this article. Why would supporters be calling him the Trump of architecture? <laughs> what? I don't know. Is it just because like, he's outspoken and, and, yeah, and that's controversial? It, right? Is that it? Yeah, it's, it's that he's, you know, he's, he's controversial, he's callous. It's that kind of thing. It's more about the attitude than, than the content, I guess. Right. But yeah, you know, so I, I guess this is going to be a thing now that anytime somebody challenges kind of politically correct status quo opinions, that they're going to be called the Trump of XYZ. Right. Yeah. So we're not off to a great start here. <laughs> and so it goes on to say the late Hadid's work might have long been a source of astonishment for its sci fi forms and gravity defying structural feats. But now she's gone. Her practice is prompting incredulity for a very different reason. The queen of the curve has been supplanted by the king of free market libertarianism, and he's not holding back. So here's a setup, and this is something that's really kind of despicable to me in this article, and there's, there's more of this later on, where it's implying that, you know, now that Zaha Hadid is gone, that Patrick has been let off the leash, you know, yeah. and that now he's, you know, kind of cashing in on, on her cachet in some way to promote his own kind of controversy. So we'll say more on this in a few minutes. So back to the article, in lengthy Facebook posts, Peppered with capital letters and exclamation marks. Right, he's crazy, right? Crazy. <laughs> right. Schumacher, who worked alongside Hadid from 1988 and now heads her practice, so that's what, 30 years almost that they worked together? Yeah. Has railed against everything from state-funded art schools, quote, an indefensible anachronism, to the, quote, PC takeover of architecture, quote, trying to paralyze us with bad conscience. Right, so he's presenting this as, you know, we all know that guy on Facebook. I happen to be talking to one of them right now. <laughs> who likes to post these long kind of rants about various topics i don't like it i just sometimes feel compelled <laughs> <laughs> you can only take so many bernie memes before you snap <laughs> <laughs> so this is another kind of theme they're going to develop here is that he's just kind of reactionary abrasive loose cannon and there's probably a subtle reference here to the way that trump sends out these crazy tweets right oh yeah sure <laughs> to continue schumacher is a regular at panel discussions if not on stage then sitting in the front row first with his hand raised, to admonish the speakers for being part of the lefty liberal conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, that's not in quotes. Although, you know, I don't doubt that Patrick probably said that at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, of course, you know, conspiracy, he's a, he's a conspiracy theorist. Right. In your interview with him, he talked about how there's certainly a very prevalent left bias within the architecture industry. And, and as you've said before, you've, you've seen some academic papers that have shown this. Right. But the word conspiracy here is used the way it's always used, which is to, again, paint him as some kind of a nut job, you know, Alex Jones crackpot or something like that. Yeah. And just to give this some context, as I understand it, I think what Patrick is reacting to with a lot of these comments about the state-funded art schools, the PC takeover of architecture, the lefty liberal conspiracy. As you'll hear in our interview, Patrick has done quite a bit of work in architectural theory. And it's his belief that architects should primarily focus on the craft and theory and design of architecture. That's our area of expertise. And I think he would say that he's seen a number of projects recently that express political ideas, almost like a political conceptual art piece, rather than focusing the design of the building on creating the best piece of architecture for the program and social functions that need to happen. And in this article, there's a quote from Patrick where he makes this sort of a point about separating the architectural theory and practice from the political theory and, and his other intellectual pursuits. He says, I must emphasize that these comments are made wearing my hat as an intellectual theorist and polemicist, which needs to be distinguished from what the practice is doing. I wouldn't want to tar the firm with the same brush, end quote. Then the article goes on. 
Juggling the demands of leading a 400-strong global architecture firm with being a political agitator is new territory for Schumacher, and you sense that the practice might not be too keen on his increasingly vocal role as a self-styled contrarian. Okay, so here we go again with Journalism 101. I can't imagine that any journalism student would be able to pass in an article in which the source of their information was, and you sensed that. (laughs) (laughs) And you sensed that the practice might not be too key on it, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that might be true or it might not be true, but there's no explanation or evidence of that here. It's just kind of poisoning the well that, again, there's this rift between the firm that represents Zaha Hadid and Patrick, who's going rogue. And it's also important to note that this article was published before that letter from the firm was. Yeah, that's right. So really, at this point, it's hard to see that there would be anything to support that comment. And so it goes on. He has only unleashed the full tar-laden potential of his brush since the untimely death of Hadid, who would often poke fun at his propensity to drift off into the realms of arcane theorizing and mock his political earnestness. So this is it again. This is that argument that I thought was so despicable. The idea that, you know, Patrick has just been let off the leash now after Zaha Hadid's passing. To say that he has only started doing this since her death, it's simply not true. If you go to Patrick's website, which is patrickschumacher.com, you can go back in 2016, he published a lengthy article called The Stages of Capitalism and the Styles of Architecture, in which he explicitly talked about his political outlook, anarcho-capitalist ideas, and what he thought the proper role was of political theorizing within the realm of architecture. So Zaha Hadid passed away in March of 2016. We can go back before that. We have an article from 2015, Parametricism with Social Parameters, where he's talking about his architectural theory of parametricism and discussing it within the context of political ideas and political correctness. We can go back to 2014, The Impact of Parametricism on Architecture and Society. Going back to 2013, he has an article called Free Market Urbanism, Urbanism Beyond Planning where the first line is parametricism makes urbanism and urban order compatible with radically liberal market processes. 2012, irony, allegory, and dystopia, architectural education as a parallel universe. So here he's talking about that issue of the political correctness within architecture schools. So there you have, going back several years before Zaha Hadid's death, he was presenting these arguments in published articles. So clearly this has nothing to do with her death. He's been trying to get some of these ideas out there for years. What's changed is now that the media has been focusing on him more so than they would have in the past because he's taken over the leadership of the firm. It seems like the narrative that Wainwright's trying to paint here is that Patrick's been this sort of Machiavellian schemer just waiting in the wings for the past 30 years (laughs) (laughs) so that he could seize the Iron Throne and start making his tyrannical diktats for a free society. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, so I think this line of reasoning is pretty poor and kind of tasteless. And the article tries to support this The next line, which is Hadid, who died in March, jokingly dismissed his theories set out in the two-volume Bible-thick auto... I don't even know how to say this word. (laughs) Autopoiesis. Autopoiesis. I think it's it's (laughs) autopoiesis. All right. Autopoiesis of architecture. And in essays with such titles as Advancing Social Functionality via Agent-Based Parametric Semiology as Patrick Metricism. So that's a play on words of Patrick and Zaha Hadid's architectural theory, which is called parametricism. Right. So here it is, right? Hadid jokingly dismissed his theories. That's pretty damning. It it makes it seem like he's just this outcast, you know, crackpot who even Zaha Hadid didn't pay any attention to. But he has a link here on the parametricism quote, and it links to a 2016 article from W Magazine shortly after Hadid's death, which that whole quote is essentially borrowed from. But here's the actual quote from W Magazine. He has elaborated on the theory in books like The Autopoiesis of Architecture and articles like Advancing Social Functionality via Agent-Based Parametric Semiology, but it's not clear whether Hadid appreciated his efforts to ground her work in academic jargon. Complaining that Schumacher's writing and lecturing took him out of the office, Hadid dismissed his theories as Patrick metricism. So you read it that way, and this doesn't sound like she's completely dismissing him. It sounds like she's kind of ribbing him about this, you know? Oh, Patrick, you know, he's... <laughs> he's all over the place. <laughs> in that same article in W Magazine, they have a quote from Zaha from a, a BBC documentary. When he had first worked in there, she said, I didn't like him and I didn't want to talk to him. He got on my nerves. But then it says, eventually she came around and began giving him pet names like Fluffy, Potato, and Cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see there that there's kind of this history here of of kind of busting his chops. And so again, that doesn't necessarily mean that Zaha Hadid accepted his theories as an explanation for her work and their work together. 
but I have listened to a few interviews with her where she says things that sound a lot like Patrick about not political topics, but about how her architecture is a response to the current condition of society, which is very different from the type of society that spurned modernism a century ago. And so I don't think it's quite honest to say that she completely dismisses theories. Again, I don't know how she thought about it, but obviously she had a tremendous amount of respect for Patrick and his work. I think that where this criticism of Patrick's theory might be coming from is that, and I think Patrick had described this somewhere, that her approach to design was more kind of intuitive and artistic, and his approach was more analytical. So she would come up with these intuitive forms, and Patrick would kind of say, you know, she doesn't really, she doesn't really understand the impact of what she's doing here. <laughs> Not in a bad way, in a good way, you know, that, that she doesn't realize like how, like how meaningful this is to the current societal condition. And so that's where he was coming back with his theoretical work to justify her artistry and to ground that within a relevant context of contemporary society. Whether she thought that was a worthwhile effort or not, who knows? But this idea that she just thought of Patrick as some kind of a crackpot, I think, is off base. Another note on this is that in 2014, Saha Hadid Architects put out a 10-minute long promotional video, which we linked to in the last episode. And in that video, Patrick is talking about parametricism, using the word parametricism, to describe the work of the firm. So whether or not Zaha herself accepted that term, it was part of the branding and messaging of the firm, even during her lifetime. And another person who has used the word parametric and parametricism to describe the work of Zaha Hadid Architects is The Guardian's own architecture and design critic. So again, the same paper that Oliver Wainwright works for. The architecture and design critic for The Guardian has accepted the term parametric as describing Zaha Hadid's work. So I found this article by the architecture and design critic for The Guardian. Hold on, let me look it up and see who the, the author was. Oh, huh. It's Oliver Wainwright. You don't say. This is an article that Wainwright wrote in March of 2016, March 31st, uh, shortly after Zaha Hadid's death, in which he described her as a creator of an entire, quote, parametric universe beyond buildings. And then he links to another article of his, which was from May 23rd of 2013, talking about the Zaha Hadid Design Gallery, which I, I guess had just opened around that time. And there he describes it like this. There are shimmering shells that have been stretched across the wall like space-age chewing gum, as well as swooshing aerodynamic sofas that make sitting down look like an extreme sport. <laughs> which is a pretty good line. <laughs> he says, everything is taut and rippling, squeezed and clenched, like it's spent too long working out in the parametric gym. And there, parametric is not in quotes. So I guess you just assume there that the audience would understand the meaning of that and that that was associated with Zaha Hadid architects. So all of this is just to point out how disingenuous it is to suggest that Zaha Hadid dismissed these theories of Patrick. You know, it's this idea that Patrick doesn't speak for Zaha, which I guess is certainly true. I mean, I don't think what I know of Zaha Hadid, I don't think anybody else could really speak for her. <laughs> so, of course, I don't know how Zaha felt about Patrick's architectural theories. But you know who else doesn't know how she felt about them is Oliver Wainwright. At least he hasn't shown that in this article. So now that Wainwright has thoroughly poisoned the well and painted a picture of Patrick as some sort of crackpot, it's time to march out the libertarians and tar them with the same brush. So the article goes on. Since his recent awakening, he has devoured a heady cocktail of writers from the Austrian school of economic thought, parentheses, based on individualism and limiting state interference in the market, close parentheses, including meltdown author Thomas Woods, who an architecture listeners should know from our last episode, Republican stockbroker Peter Schiff, I don't know if I'd call him Republican. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't see him as a Trump voter. Yeah. And ex-Reagan budget director David Stockman. Okay, so first of all, the fact that he actually mentioned any libertarians by name is worthy of applause, so why don't we give him three claps? Good on you, Ollie. <laughs> okay, now, what's wrong with this paragraph? The paragraph begins by describing the, these libertarian ideas as a, as a heady cocktail. <laughs> so here it is again. He's like this aloof ivory tower elite who can't possibly relate to the common man. Well, and, and heady cocktail, I mean, to me, that <laughs> when I read that, I was thinking that's like he's brainwashing himself with this stuff that he's reading on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Now, the first time I read this, I remember coming away from this particular paragraph with a much more bitter taste in my mouth. And reading it again today, I couldn't really remember where that had come from, because here he just kind of lists these guys' names. But down at the bottom of the article, I noticed that there's a note saying that the article was amended, and an earlier version said incorrectly that David Stockman was recently indicted on six counts of fraud, 
He was indicted in 2007, but the charges were dropped in 2009. So that must have been what I had seen. Right. So the whole paragraph was actually just a setup to shoot down David Stockman. Right. So so he was trying to paint these guys as you know a bunch of frauds and you know Republicans and Reagan people. They got nothing on Woods though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't call him a neo confederate. <laughs> neo confederate. <laughs> yeah, so again, this is where I think that the article does try to give Patrick a, a fair shake. You know, it does dig in a little bit and and draw out some of these influences and reference the set of ideas. This isn't just all in Patrick's head. There is a school of thought that he's drawing from. So I thought that was to Wainwright's credit in this article. Yeah, it is pretty rare that you actually see that sort of a context put forward when someone's criticizing libertarian ideas that they actually tell you where to find some of those ideas. Or even that there's a broader school of thought that's, that's circulating these ideas. Right. So continuing on, Schumacher refuses labels, but his position is founded on a fundamental faith in the power of the pure unbridled market to solve everything, from housing provision to unemployment regulation, imagining a world where privatization is extended to streets, city management, and possibly even legal systems. Quote, instead of calling for the state with every problem, he says, why not see it as an entrepreneurial opportunity? So I think it's interesting that he used the word fundamental here. I mean, I think that's a subtle attempt to paint him as, as a fundamentalist. And you do hear the term market fundamentalist thrown around. I don't know if he uses it in this article anywhere. And of course, he has faith in the free market to solve everything. Yeah, and of course, this is an oversimplification of, of everything that we've talked about on this podcast, this whole set of ideas. This idea of an unbridled market Yes, we would prefer a market that doesn't have government interference, but that doesn't mean that it would be unbridled. <laughs> the idea is that you could have standards and legal systems develop in an entrepreneurial fashion without resorting to a government that has a territorial monopoly on the initiation of force. And the idea that this would solve everything, <laughs> as I said in my article, of course, it can't solve everything. Nothing can solve everything. <laughs> but the hope is that the kind of results that you would get from a, a more libertarian society would be much more responsive to people's needs and values and preferences than the static one-size-fits-all solutions of government. Yeah, I mean, the subtext here, and this is something that libertarians get all the time, is that we're trying to promote some sort of utopian vision of the world where everyone just abides by the non-aggression principle and has this religious belief that the invisible hand shall provide. <laughs> <laughs> and if you actually read any of the writings of the Austrian school, guys like Mises and Hayek, <laughs> you'll see that they were very critical of the actual utopians who were promoting all these crazy ideas back in their day. These guys had, what, 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 was that, uh, what was that ideology that these guys were following? Um, oh, it was socialism. Yeah, that's not at all utopian. So instead of having faith in market processes, they had faith in politicians and maybe voters. God help us. <laughs> I don't know, it's going pretty well over here in the States. <laughs> yeah, just ask the Democrats. You'll hear in the interview at one point, Patrick mentions the Nirvana fallacy. This is when someone makes an argument that if your proposed solution can't solve everything, that it just needs to be dismissed altogether. When really the response to that is, well, hold on, you know, nobody's saying it can solve everything. So just because anarchism or, or libertarianism might not immediately give everyone on earth an acceptable standard of living, that doesn't mean that it couldn't possibly help a lot of people to be better off than they are under a status system. <laughs> So the article continues with a pretty good summary of some of the private solutions that Patrick has considered. There's one called pocket living. There's one called the collective, which is a co-living environment. The elimination of space standards where the local government actually prescribes the size of rooms and houses, as well as the promise of Airbnb, the burgeoning nation of Liberland, <laughs> which is a really interesting story in itself, as well as the prospect of free private cities. And one thing I want to mention here is that in the lecture Patrick gave that set this all off, the whole first half of his lecture was talking about these innovative solutions, both design solutions as well as commercial solutions, for producing more low-cost housing within cities. And that just gets completely ignored by most of the media coverage of his speech. You know, the fact that he was actually putting forward what he believes are some positive solutions for the housing crisis. And the article goes on with another quote from Patrick. I think governance as a business offering is an interesting idea to pursue. He cites the privately run Indian city of Gurgaon as a promising example, a place where residents prosper at the expense of the surrounding area, their sewage dumped in rivers, the groundwater depleted by private boreholes, with citizens segregated in elite colonies and high-rise ghettos. Quote, equality is an aspiration, he adds, 
but it should not be a priority over economic progress. So, Tim, you know a little bit about Gurgaon. Do you have anything to say here? Right. Well, first of all, you know, of course, in the article, they have a picture of Gurgaon where there's a kid just sitting in the dirt with all these high rises behind him, right? Yeah. <laughs> And so, of course, the first thing to remember is that this is India. There are a lot of very poor areas of India. I think this was one of them before the city started being developed. And there are probably a lot of places in India where you could take a picture of a kid sitting in dirt with just dirt behind him. <laughs> so what is Gargan and what's special about that place? We've posted a few articles on our Twitter feed about this, but it's a, it's a city in India that has been developed essentially as a private city. It's an area of the country where the local government was very weak. And the, I'm not sure who, who orchestrated it, but I think the central government wanted to encourage development in this area. So they allowed private developers to come in with very little restrictions and to create this city the way that they wanted to, without a lot of regulation or support from either the local or central government. And as a result, it's attracted some kind of global technology firms to come and set up offices there. And then they have workers who live in the, in the housing that's been built. So while it's not perfect, this is pretty close to the idea of a private city. And I think what's remarkable here is that it has brought a measure of wealth to an area that otherwise would have probably remained stagnating in poverty. Now, of course, there's inequality there. I mean, I mean, however big you draw the circle around the city, eventually you're going to wrap in some people who are much poorer than the people who are able to live within the high rises. And that's not unique to Gurgaon. That's the same with any city, especially new cities that are growing in developing areas. There's always going to be a divide there between the people who can afford to live in the newer developments and the people who are stuck in undeveloped areas. You know, again, this isn't anything unique to a private city or even Gurgaon in particular. I can't imagine how Wainwright or anybody else would imagine a city anywhere being developed that wouldn't have inequality between the people who are able to move into the city and the people who are still living a more rural kind of life. And another thing about inequality is that there's always going to be someone whose income is basically zero or very close to it. And when people talk about inequality, I mean, there's a few ways you can measure it. You could say that there's, you know, here's, here's what the richest people in the society make and here's what the poorest people make. And another way to do it is here's what the median income is versus what the poorest make. Now, as long as there's someone who has practically zero income, then that measure of inequality, as long as anyone is getting richer, then inequality goes up. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the poor are worse off. Especially if it's something, if you're using a measure like the median income, that means that there are more poor people who are becoming richer. Even though there are still a lot of poor people, there are more poor people who are, whose incomes are increasing in order to push up that median income. So what this means is that whatever's creating this inequality is potentially creating a lot of opportunity for the people at the bottom. And now I'm sure people can find exceptions to this, you know, and talk about trickle down economics or whatever. But this word inequality gets thrown around so much, and I think it's the wrong measure to be using here. What's really more important is looking at the change in situation for some of the poorest people. And are some of them able to gain more economic mobility as a result of the broader economic progress? So when Patrick makes this comment about equality shouldn't be a priority over economic progress, that's the sort of thing that I think he's saying, is that equality isn't really the best metric to use if you're concerned about people's welfare. What you should be looking at is economic progress and how it affects these poorest people. Right. It's, it's the saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah. This, again, is kind of the nirvana fallacy, right? It's like, well, if this private city of Gurgaon hasn't solved inequality in India, <laughs> and of course, you have to ask the question, well, what's the alternative solution? Of course, the only solution to inequality is to give everybody the same standard of living. And in a world of scarcity, if you're going to give everybody the same standard of living, that standard of living is going to have to be very low. And so this is essentially what we've seen in communist and socialist countries that have failed. Yeah, you don't see too many articles in The Guardian about the inequality in Venezuela, do you? <laughs> right. But the main point Wainwright is making in this paragraph is the environmental damage that the city of Gurgaon has caused with dumping sewage in the rivers and depleting the groundwater. So as I understand it, even though this was developed almost entirely as a private city, there were some infrastructure pieces that were to be provided by the local or the, or the central government, I'm not sure who. And one of these, of course, was sewer. Oh, what a shocker. <laughs> and so, of course, this is a thing that everybody points to. You know, they say, oh, look, here's this private city, but they can't even get their undesirable material to flow downhill. <laughs> they literally can't get their shit together. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a stronger insinuation here, which is that it's not only that they couldn't coordinate this stuff, it's that they're literally crapping on everyone else in India by dumping their sewage into the river. <laughs> so it fits into this narrative of, you know, these greedy capitalists exploiting everyone and not caring about the environment. 
Okay, so back to the article. Throughout our conversation and the various lectures of his I have attended, it is often hard to tell whether he actually believes in what he is saying or if he is merely playing the provocateur. There are occasional glimmers of humility, as if he can see the absurdity of some of his pronouncements, which he sometimes suggests are merely thought experiments. Okay, so this is twisting the knife, right? It's not just that the public and the firm and Zaha Hadid herself all think that these ideas are crazy, but it's that Patrick himself doesn't even believe them, right? <laughs> that he's just trying to be provocative, that he doesn't really understand or believe these things, and that he's just lobbing these thought grenades out into the public. Yeah, and the idea that these ideas are absurd is just taken as a given, <laughs> <laughs> right? Without any argument. He's confident that he's already convinced his audience of the absurdity of all of these things by this point in the article. Just by stating them. Yeah. So this appears to be based on this quote about thought experiments. He says that Patrick sometimes suggests that these are merely thought experiments. And that line, the words thought experiments are in quotes, but the word merely is not. So in other words, Patrick didn't say that these are merely thought experiments. Patrick said that these are thought experiments. <laughs> <laughs> so the question then is, are thought experiments valid or valuable? All of these things that Patrick is presenting and of course many similar things that we propose on this podcast, are thought experiments. They're valid hypotheses about possible future opportunities. So of course we're not at a stage in history where we can look at an anarcho-capitalist society and say whether it's succeeded or failed. Although we can do that with a few socialist societies. Yeah, exactly. But based on what we know about economic action, we can evaluate these admittedly radical ideas and try to see if it's worthwhile trying to pursue them. And just to demonstrate the validity of thought experiments, Zaha Hadid was referred to for years as a paper architect. So she had her architecture practice. She was producing designs for buildings, um, often for competitions. But it was years before she actually had a commission project that was built. And yet her ideas and designs were influential within the industry. And through those thought experiments, these hypothetical projects, she was able to start to convince people of the value of her designs. And so where did those thought experiments get her? Well, at the time of her death, Zaha Hadid Architects was one of the 50 largest firms in the world, completing some of the most progressive and visionary architecture of anybody practicing today. So there you go. That's just one example of what can happen by pursuing something that's merely a thought experiment. And Wainwright continues on a similar vein with a quote from Patrick. I am on a steep learning curve, he admits. I'm not certain about what I'm saying, but I think these arguments are worth floating. So the man who has this fundamentalist faith in market forces to solve everything, turns out he's not certain what he's saying. So one way to interpret this is that he simply doesn't know what he's talking about, which I think is the intention here with including this quote. But the other is to see that he's actually being a bit more scientific about it, saying, well, look, you know, these are thought experiments and there is uncertainty with these things. And if Wainwright took the time to actually study the Austrian school a little bit, he might learn that uncertainty is a core component of that philosophy. You know, he spent this whole article talking about how outspoken and uncompromising and fundamentalist Patrick is in some of these ideas. But then he takes this little moment of humility and throws it back in his face. And what I took away from your interview with Patrick was that, was that he's pretty far along that steep learning curve. He understands these theories. And I don't want to put words into his mouth, but the impression I get is that the learning curve he's on is in thinking about how these would apply to the built environment. Well, and I think specifically the housing issues and maybe the specific policies within the city of London, you know, that, that might be the learning curve that he's on, is, is fully understanding all the ins and outs of London's housing policies. And in the next paragraph, Wainwright puts a light on Patrick's uncertainty about the ins and outs of the London housing market. It is healthy for the left to be given a shake, to be wrenched from the fuzzy echo chamber, but much of Schumacher's rhetoric verges on post-truth territory. And what he links to there is, is I guess, post-truth was the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year for 2016 or something like that. And the way that's defined is that it's, it's essentially just an appeal to emotion, basically just giving up on trying to persuade people with facts and just relying on a, on a blatant appeal to emotion. Now, <laughs> now, I'm not sure what emotion Patrick was appealing to in this speech, <laughs> but the emotions in the crowd certainly didn't reflect the ideas that Patrick was hoping for. <laughs> it's hard to see anything that Patrick has said or written from what I've seen as being interpreted as any sort of an appeal to emotion. <laughs> no. I mean, if anything, it's a little bit too far in the opposite direction in that he's very analytical and wants to really systematize things and explain them in very scientific terms. So I think this is just another kind of subtle jab to try to equate him with Trump or the alt-right or something like that, which is, it's just sloppy. 
Continuing on. When challenged on specifics, he fumbles and flounders, with no answer to why Britain's house builders are sitting on 600,000 plots of land with planning permission, while their profits soar. No appreciation that the housing market doesn't simply behave according to the pure logic of supply and demand. Of course it doesn't, <laughs> because it's riddled with government intervention. <laughs> that's pretty much the whole point. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly this point. So who knows what Patrick said about this in the interview, but I think we can take a stab at it. So when you see something like this, I mean, you have to think that there's a reason that this is happening, right? I mean, why would a home builder have all this land that they're not building if that's what they do to make money? And the issue is that there's this phenomenon of land banking where companies buy plots of land, get them permitted for building, and then either sit on them as the value appreciates or sell them to other companies who may then resell them and resell them until somebody finally decides that they want to build on it. So essentially, this land ownership just becomes part of the portfolio of these companies. Of course, any company that's developing new projects is going to want to have some land in place because it takes time to get land secured, to get it purchased, and then obviously to get it permitted in order to build a large development. And once they own a number of plots, there might then be a, a process of prioritizing those plots and deciding where they want to invest their money first in order to develop housing. So there's a simple equation where if the expected appreciation of the land can produce a better profit than the cost and risk of constructing housing, then the rational thing to do is to hold the land as it appreciates or to sell it. And this does two things for them. It becomes a source of revenue, and it also gives them some insurance and, and some security that they'll have land to build on as they complete their other projects. And I'm not sure exactly how the financing works with all this, but I would imagine that they might be taking some of that land and collateralizing it in order to secure financing for other construction projects that they might be undertaking. So I think there could be a number of explanations for this. And the idea that these companies have a duty to the crown to, to start building houses, <laughs> I mean, they're not going to do it at a loss or even at a lower profit than, than what they can get from the value of the land. Right. But I think that's what Wainwright's criticism is, is that here you have these private developers, all they're doing is trying to seek a profit. And that's why they're not developing because they don't care about the people. They're just, all they care about is making a profit. But I think the question that needs to be asked here is, is why are these property values appreciating so quickly that it doesn't even make sense to build on them and create some sort of an asset that can actually generate a return? And I think an explanation is that this is simply another property bubble that has come about as a result of all these low interest rate policies that we've been seeing since the global financial crisis. Yeah, and it's similar to the, the buy to leave phenomenon that the mayor was complaining about. You have people coming in and investing in land and apartments and housing units in London foreign investors coming in and investing in these things. Because in a world of low interest rates, investors don't have many options for places that they can park money where it can earn income with a minimum of risk. You know, there were times when bond rates were higher, when they could go and buy bonds and, and have a pretty stable investment income from a low risk bond. But with interest rates so low, those opportunities go away and people start looking at real estate, which despite the housing crash in 2008, tends to be stable over long term and often has meaningful, predictable appreciation. I think I can explain this whole issue of 600,000 permitted units that aren't being built in three words. And those three words are great crested newts. Of course, that's all I had to say. Why didn't <laughs> Wainwright say that? So I might need to explain that a little bit. About two months after Patrick's speech and Oliver Wainwright's interview with Patrick, Wainwright put out another article addressing this issue of the 600,000 permitted lots that aren't being built. So I have an advantage here that Patrick didn't have of having the hindsight of understanding what Oliver Wainwright thinks about this whole issue. One quote from this article that immediately jumped out at me is Wainwright says, quote, if you get it right, land is one of the most lucrative commodities to be in. According to the Valuation Office, the average price of agricultural land in England is 21,000 pounds per hectare, while land with planning permission for housing is around 6 million pounds per hectare. If you have the alchemical skills to transform one into the other, as water into wine, you've multiplied the value of your asset almost 300 times over. Jeez. So without knowing anything else about the permitting process, about home builders, about anything else in the, the, London, the London housing market, what does that tell you? If the simple fact of getting land permitted for building increases its value by 300 times, do you think that just maybe there's some kind of constraint there in the planning process itself? So Wainwright kind of addresses this, but then he just kind of brushes it off. He says, quote, It is true that local authorities have had their planning departments ruthlessly slashed, but the delays have less to do with red tape than the commercial desire to keep house prices high. 
Getting planning permission isn't the issue. England consistently grants twice as many permissions as homes that are started. House builders build slowly, not because of bureaucracy, nor because of the Herculean effort of cementing bricks into place, but because if they built too many homes at once and flooded the market, prices would plummet. So this is his thesis statement for this whole article. And the only thing he said there about planning permission is that somehow this fact that there are so many planning permissions granted shows that the effort of getting planning permission isn't difficult. But of course, one doesn't follow from the other. Well, it seems pretty cut and dry to me. I mean, it's just greed, right? It's because capitalists are just greedy, so that's case closed. So this other point he made there is that you know, home builders are intentionally building slowly. You know, this is kind of like the diamond monopolists who have a big vault somewhere where they mine all these diamonds and then keep them in a vault. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that house builders are just hoarding all this land and that they're not building because they're controlling the market here, right? Right. Which, first of all, is simply nonsense because there's only something like 150,000 homes built per year in the UK. And when you're selling new homes, you're not just competing with all the other new homes. So it's not like if you cut back your production by 10%, then you're going to see a 10% profit in new homes. New homes being sold on the market are competing with every other house that's being sold on the market. So those 150,000 units that come on the market in any given year are just a drop in the ocean of all of the residential real estate transactions that are happening within the country. Yeah, this is a common mistake that people make when they try to analyze monopolies and monopoly prices, or they'll look at a supply and demand curve and they're only looking at the price that a monopolist is trying to get. So they think that the monopolist wants to maximize prices, but that's not the case. What he wants to maximize is his total revenues or total profits, really. And that's a bit more complex calculation because it involves not only the price, but the number of units sold. So even if you had a monopolist that was the only home builder in London, there's a certain sweet spot at which the combination of price and volume is going to give him his best return. And it may be a higher or a lower price than the current market price. So there are two arguments here that we need to flush out. One is that house builders aren't building enough, that they're not increasing their capacity to match the number of units permitted. And the second, of course, is this argument that getting planning permission isn't the issue, and that they're not building slowly because of bureaucracy. So I think the people to pose these questions to are the home builders themselves. And luckily for us, The Guardian did just that in the original article that Wainwright had linked to. And he references some of these quotes in this newer article that came out in January. So I'm just going to paraphrase a few of the quotes here. We have John Stewart, Director of Economic Affairs at the Home Builders Federation, which is an industry group of home builders, said, over the past few years, house building has increased output at the steepest rate for decades, with the most recent figures showing a 25% year-on-year increase in housing supply. The industry is recruiting and training tens of thousands of new people to ensure it can continue to deliver significant sustainable increases and provide the high-quality homes the country needs. And I found another quote from the Home Builders Federation in a separate paper that said that housing supply is up 52% in the past three years. So for any industry, a 52% increase over three years is pretty impressive growth. What was that, 25% year on year? That's huge. Right. I mean, I don't know how much faster Wainwright thinks that these guys can expand their businesses. I mean, these are businesses. It's not, it wouldn't be responsible for a business to just go out there and double their staff within a year and expect that that's all going to go smoothly. Especially for these long-term capital projects. Right. So assuming that those numbers from the Home Builders Federation can be believed, Wainwright's whole argument here has kind of lost a lot of the air. Let's look at some quotes from specific companies. Here's a quote from Berkeley, which is a big home builder. It said, the company was building on all sites that have an, quote, implementable planning consent, unquote. The challenge is often getting around conditions cleared for development. In London, planning departments have been cut by more than 50% over the last five years. The most important word he said in that paragraph was the word conditions. We'll come back to that in a minute. You're going to keep hearing it from these other guys. Barrett, who's another home builder, said it was building 40% more homes than four years ago, when the industry was still recovering from the financial crisis, but that shortages of skilled workers and materials were hampering progress. Quote, this has been achieved whilst overcoming a number of well-publicized housing market challenges particularly brick and labor shortages, unquote. So there you have some explanation of the difficulty of growing these firms quickly and getting more projects underway. But despite that, he said that they have increased their production by 40% over four years. And he goes on to say, we have an extensive program of recruitment, and we now have more apprentices in training than at any time since 2007. We have virtually no sites that have an implementable planning consent that are not in production. And here comes that word conditions again. Whilst it is improving, the planning process is slow and complex, 
and a number of conditions need to be fulfilled before development can commence on our sites. A shortage of resources in planning departments also often means that delays occur in this process. And so what are these conditions that everyone's talking about? What's happening here is that because the planning process has gotten so bogged down in so many localities, the central government has been putting pressure and I think even deadlines on planning departments to grant planning permissions, or at least rule one way or the other, on whether permission is going to be granted for proposed sites. But as you've also heard, these planning departments are grossly understaffed. So over the years, they've taken on more and more responsibility, or at least more and more authority, for what aspects of these developments they have a say over. But at the same time, their staffing has been getting cut, so they can't actually review these things in any kind of a timely manner. So what they're doing is going ahead and granting permission for projects, but then tagging on a number of what are called pre-commencement conditions. So that even though you've been granted planning permission for a project, you now have something like 10 or 20 or 30 conditions that you have to provide more documentation on and have reviewed further and maybe have hearings and all this other stuff before you can actually put a shovel in the ground. So the fact that Wainwright is putting these 600,000 permitted lots out there as lots that could be built upon today is simply untrue. What you need to know is how many sites have implementable planning consent, which is a quote we heard from some of the home builders. That means that the permission has been granted, but also all of the pre-commencement conditions have been satisfied. And not only that, but oftentimes planning permission will be given to a developer before he actually owns the land. So they'll set up an option with a landowner to purchase the property, but on the condition that planning permission is granted and and that it's ready to build. In other words, they're not actually buying the land until it's been cleared for them to build on. So you could imagine that that process of coming back to the landowner and completing the sale could take some time as well. So what are these conditions? I mean, what kind of hoops do they have to jump through to satisfy them? These conditions could be almost anything. They tend to be project specific and possibly based on specific concerns of the community or the plan reviewers. And this isn't unique to England. It's very common even in the U.S. for planning approvals to have a handful of conditions attached to them for further study and documentation that need to be provided after permission is granted but before either construction or before occupation. And this is actually a good thing because these are typically questions that haven't been answered by the original planning application. And so rather than holding up the entire approval for a handful of minor questions, they'll grant approval, but then require follow-up on these conditions. So fair enough. And it's usually not that big a deal if you only have, you know, five or maybe even 10 of these things. But what seems to be happening here in the UK is that some of these projects have 50 or more conditions attached to them. And maybe half of those could be pre-commencement conditions. The Home Builders Federation put out a press release in January, before Wainwright's article came out, in which they talked about these pre-commencement conditions and how it delays the construction process. The press release came out January 3rd, 2017. It's titled, New Home Planning Permissions Up, But System Remains a Constraint. And in that article, they linked to a PDF, which is kind of a white paper that they had put out, titled, Pre-Commencement Conditions. And to give you an idea of the burden that these conditions put on these home builders, this is a quote. It says, for example, one builder has reported that it has a site on which the average time taken to discharge an individual condition is 25 weeks. Another where one inappropriate condition related to highways took nine months to resolve. So these conditions aren't just a matter of kind of sloppy documentation by the design team. I know that on projects I've worked on, when you get planning approval and get these conditions back, you drop everything and try to get the conditions turned around and sent back to them as soon as humanly possible. Because depending on the approval process, they can take four or five or six or eight weeks to review them in-house. And then you may need to have further hearings, further allowances for appeals by neighbors. So the final resolution of these conditions takes time. And it sounds like here in England, in part because of the lack of staffing in these planning departments, that those delays are just taking longer and longer. Now it gets better. So fair enough, you know, assigning conditions is part of the process. But another complaint that the Home Builders Federation has is the content of the conditions that are being applied. They've actually listed a number of specific examples from certain projects and talked about the delay that it has caused and offer commentary on whether or not they think they're appropriate. So for example, the first one here says that as a pre-commencement addition, a builder was required to provide full details of a play area with a plan at 1 to 200 scale showing the siting of design of play equipment, refuse bins, picnic tables, and seating. And the Home Builders Federation says here that this is inappropriate as a pre-commencement condition for a development of 1,400 homes, 66-bed care home, new roundabout, new road, and primary school extension. So in other words, the design and details of a playground is holding up this entire development. Jeez. And there are a number of examples like that in here. Some other examples they give are things like installation of a super-fast broadband infrastructure, 
which is something that is out of the developer's control, right? That's another vendor has to come in and provide that. And similarly, planners are requiring documentation of certain elements that aren't under their purview. They're under the purview of another agency, like a building department, a highway department, or environmental health. Similar to the playground example, they're requiring, as pre-commencement conditions, things like full details of solar panels, utility boxes, window and door details, and electric car charging points. <laughs> Again, just the review of these details are holding up these entire developments. And beyond that, I mean, these things just start to get comical. They're requiring documentation of all of the locations of public art as a pre-commencement condition, approval of bat boxes as a pre-commencement condition. <laughs> and the best example is literally straight out of Monty Python. Some planning board was requiring some builder to provide, quote, a full survey on great crested newts before each phase begins. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, this is a multi-phase project, and they have to provide this survey not once, but before each phase begins. So this is like having multiple pre-commencement conditions or a pre-commencement condition for each phase, all because of these great crested newts. So fair enough, you know, I mean, we need to protect wildlife. I mean, reasonable men can disagree on the importance of great crested newts to the betterment of mankind. But fair enough, let's grant them that. We need to protect the great crested newts, and the planning process can be a legitimate means of doing that. So it sounds like this is just another greedy developer that just doesn't care about great crested newts and is going to just roll in the bulldozers with complete disregard to the delicate newt ecosystem. Yeah, well, not exactly. According to the paper here, during the application stage, so before planning permission was granted, before this great crested newt condition was made a requirement for the project, the builder did in fact submit a detailed study which confirmed no presence or risk of newts. Oh, thank God. Newt, newt, newt. So to me, this demonstrates that the local planning processes in the UK that, that the construction of new homes are dependent upon are just completely out of control. So Wainwright's argument that this red tape isn't a problem just because some builders are actually able to persevere and get through all this process to actually get things permitted doesn't do anything to disprove the notion that the process itself is an enormous burden on anybody who's trying to get through it. And in fact, in one of the articles that Wainwright linked to here, this is a blog post on the shelter.org policy blog called Land Banking, What's the Story? And the article has some interesting statistics. But what caught my eye was the first comment down at the bottom of the article. So this comment by Helen Howey on December 15th, 2016 says, I am a planner and know from experience how long it can take to get a site through the local plan process, typically three years minimum, and then to get planning permission for a large site up to two years for detailed consent. In these circumstances, I can understand why large house builders need to ensure that they have at least five years land in their pipeline and for business continuity and resilience, preferably six to seven years worth. The root cause of the problem is a very real difficulty in getting sites through the planning process. After 15 years in planning, it appears to be getting ever more difficult to get planning consent, which is surely moving in the wrong direction if the country is going to solve the housing crisis. This isn't a home builder complaining. This is an actual planner complaining about it. Yeah, apparently. And, and of course, that's anecdotal. But it offers an explanation for all of these things that Wainwright is so puzzled about in this article, of why there are so many permitted, or at least nominally permitted, plots owned by these home builders that aren't being built upon, and why there's such a difference in the value of permitted land as compared to unpermitted land. And you know, another effect that this burdensome permitting process has is that it's especially corrosive to small and medium home builders who can't absorb the costs and delays and uncertainties of these lengthy planning approvals. So if you're a small home builder, you might not be able to purchase and finance and sit on a site for five years before you can put a shovel in the ground. Not only that, but you're probably going to have a hard time getting lending in the first place so that you can even finance the initial purchase. And so what we've seen in England is that there's been a drastic drop in the number of small and medium home builders over the years. I've seen some quotes that the number of small home builders in the UK has decreased from 9,000 to 3,000 over the past few decades. And this means a few things. Of course, it means that you have less small home builders to take on smaller projects, but it also means that less of them are growing and turning into some of these larger home builders that can take on the bigger projects and pump out more production more quickly. And similarly, it's difficult for foreign builders to come into the UK and start building the relationships that they need with the local planning authorities in order to start to contribute more construction in the market. So this planning process is cutting off home builders at both ends of the spectrum, both the small home builders and potential larger home builders, so that the entire country is dependent on just a handful of established larger home builder firms to provide all the housing for the country. And as you said before, these firms are growing or are at least increasing output but maybe that's not enough to make up for the losses in the output of these smaller firms. What you would expect to see in any market where prices are rising 
like this residential market in the UK, is you should see existing service providers increasing their service, which we've seen here the home builders are actually doing. You should also see new service providers coming on the market. That could be small independent service providers or larger companies that are working in different countries. I mean, there should be a gold rush here of home builders coming to the UK to build more homes for people. And the reason we're not seeing that happen, I think, is primarily because of this Byzantine planning process that only a select few established firms are able to navigate. Before we finish this point, I have another myth to dispel in, in this Oliver Wainwright article. He complains elsewhere in the article that the system of land banking, which is happening in the UK, essentially you have firms going out and buying land and getting it permitted and then selling it onto other firms and then they sell it to other firms and eventually it gets sold to a home builder who can actually build on it. And by the time it does, the price was much higher than it was initially. Now, Wainwright sees this as a problem. You know, he thinks that these land speculators or land traders shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't have so many people going out and buying up land and getting it permitted and then sold on at these exorbitant prices. But of course, it's not the land traders that are making that land so expensive. It's ultimately the home builders and the home purchasers that are buying the land at those prices that are establishing those prices on the market. What the land traders are doing is discovering the value of this land to the market. And again, the fact that the price goes up by a factor of 300 demonstrates the problem with the planning process. Of course, the problem that presents itself when the land gets that expensive is that it doesn't make economic sense for these home builders to build affordable units on these lots. Because let's say you have a lot that's worth $100,000. You buy that lot, you could build a house that costs $100,000 on it, sell that for $200,000, and that's a viable project. But if you have a plot of land that's worth $500,000 and you build a house that's worth $100,000 on it, nobody's going to want to come in and pay $600,000 for what is essentially a $100,000 home that just happens to be well located. Sounds like you haven't been to Australia lately. <laughs> I said well located. I don't think Australia is well located for anything. Ooh. Yeah, what's the temperature where you are right now? <laughs> Touche. <laughs> so you would think that if Oliver Wainwright wants buildable land to get cheaper, that he should want there to be more land traders out there, that there should be more people who are going out, buying land from farmers, and converting it to property with planning permission. Because the problem in England isn't that there's not enough land to build on, it's that there isn't enough permanent land to build on. So if you want the price of permanent land to come down, you need to increase the supply of permanent land. And then if you have, as you do in the UK, a limited number of home builders who could potentially buy that land, choosing to buy land from a larger supply of plots, then we should expect the price of that land to come down relative to a situation where you have less plots of land on the market. So I don't know why Wainwright is vilifying these land traders. I mean, they're the only ones out there who are actually producing buildable lots. And producing more buildable lots is the only thing that's going to make this land cheaper that would allow builders to justify providing more affordable housing. Wainwright ends the article with sort of a bait and switch. He says, Let his ideas be thrashed out and interrogated. But I'm inclined to agree with Noam Chomsky's take on anarcho-capitalism. This is a quote from Chomsky. A sick joke, perhaps worth some moments in an academic seminar, but nowhere else. It is a doctrine, Chomsky concludes, that, if ever implemented, would lead to forms of tyranny and oppression that have few counterparts in human history. So Chomsky's a guy who has been very influential to many people who would call themselves anarchists, especially on what you'd call the, the left anarchist or what do they call it, libertarian socialist side of things. Now, my understanding is that Chomsky favors a political system known as anarcho-syndicalism, so I'm going to take a bit of a cheap shot here and to explain to you my understanding of what syndicalism means. So we've written up a little script here for a play called Syndicalism in One Act. Hi, Joe. Hi, Tim. How are you today? I'm feeling sad. Why so glum? Well, Tim, corporations are evil because they make profits. Huh. Governments are evil because they support corporations. Let's get rid of corporations and governments! But, modern production relies on cooperation between many people. So, we need organizations that can coordinate diverse resources to produce goods. Like corporations! But, corporations are evil, so we'll call them... Syndicates! Great! And there won't be any profits, because profits are evil. 
Oh, and there won't be any wages because money is evil. Yeah, there won't be any money at all. So, how will we decide who gets what? Well, I learned in school that sometimes people make decisions by voting. Voting makes things fair. Great! Every decision will be made by voting. That's empowerment. Let's go vandalize a popular franchise coffee shop. That will make everyone want to be an anarcho-syndicalist. So like I said, it's a bit of a cheap shot, but <laughs> syndicalism is, is sort of this Marxian dream where everyone will form into unions. The unions will take over ownership of all the factories. There will be no wages, and somehow everything just gets sorted out by voting. What these ideas are blind to is the service that entrepreneurs and employers provide to their employees, right? So of course we know what employees do for employers. They go and they work for them and they produce things, and then the, the employers take the products and sell them and, and take all the profits. And all the employees get is a measly wage that they are powerless to negotiate. But Austrian economists point out that entrepreneurs provide a critical function to employees, namely that they take their savings and pay wages to the employees before anything that the employees produce can be sold for revenue. So in other words, if you're an auto worker working in a factory producing a car, if everybody shows up on the first day of work and starts making a car, you know, they won't get paid until that first car can be sold, which might be weeks or months later. Not only that, but they're all assuming the risk that their car will be sold at all. And of course, the entrepreneur provides the capital equipment, you know, the factories and the tools and everything that they need to do their job and buys all the raw materials so that all the employees have to do is to show up, do the work and collect their paycheck. The employees aren't taking on any risk. They're not investing any of their own savings and they have everything they need to do their job. So this idea that all these workers will band together and start their own syndicates, you know, their own corporations, essentially. What that does is it puts a risk of entrepreneurship and the obligation to spend down their savings until they're able to start to realize some revenue on every single one of those workers. So this is not exploitation of the employee by the employer. It's simply an agreement between the two of them to work together with designated roles and risk allowances. So when you hear about some black masked anarchist smashing a Starbucks window, you know, do you think that's an anarcho-capitalist or an anarcho-socialist or anarcho-syndicalist or whatever? <laughs> so this is the sort of the result that you get from an ideology of syndicalism and corporations are evil. And we should note that, of course, there are situations where corporations are evil. As we've said before, many big corporations are in bed with government, and they're able to secure special treatment from government. And the worst offenders here are financial firms who, through fractional reserve banking and other means, cause gross distortions in financial markets and in general just give free markets a bad name. But that has nothing to do with the fact that they're a corporation. It has to do with the fact that government is giving them special treatment. So Wainwright links to an interview with Chomsky. So in this article, Chomsky says a few other things about anarcho-capitalism. He says, The idea of a free contract between the potentate and his starving subject is a sick joke, perhaps worth some moments in an academic seminar exploring the consequences of, in my view, absurd ideas, but nowhere else. So this is the line that Wainwright picked out and, and kind of twisted out of context to imply that it's talking about anarcho-capitalism. But what Chomsky is saying is that the idea of two people contracting together in an employment situation is what is a sick joke. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that could never happen. Right. So, I mean, you know, take that for what it's worth. This is Chomsky's view. So if this is a guy you're lining up with, I think you have some explaining to do. But the point that Chomsky is really trying to make here isn't that contracts are impossible, but it's the notion that a contract between a potentate, or I guess a rich person, and a serf, or a poor person, could never be technically considered free because the poor person is in a much weaker negotiating position than the rich person. So this is your typical kind of Marxian power dynamics, class struggle kind of stuff. Yeah, I understand the point here, and in a sense he's right. If you have someone who's desperate for a job or desperate for money, he might be willing to work for next to nothing just to wrangle a few pennies out of the grubby fists of the greedy capitalist. But to say that this starving subject, the serf, whatever you want to call him, is powerless in this negotiation is wrong. If the capitalist is considering hiring this guy, then obviously that capitalist has a need for a laborer, or else why would he even be entertaining that offer of employment? So this is a negotiation. The serf has his employment to offer, and the capitalist has a wage to offer. 
and it's up to each of them to decide at what price it makes sense for the serfs to agree to be employed and for the capitalists to agree to employ him and pay him wages. So this is what's wrong with Chomsky's statement. There are always inequalities in negotiations where one party might have some advantage over the other party, but as long as each of those people is allowed to negotiate the price at which they come to an agreement, then that inequality gets mediated by the price. And there are a few tacit assumptions that Chomsky smuggles in here. One is that the capitalist is in a position where he's essentially a monopsony hierarch, which means that he's the only game in town, and that the serf has no other options but to get a job from this one employer. Now, this may have been how things looked in certain factory towns during the Industrial Revolution when Marx was writing, but with the mobility of capital and labor these days, it's kind of silly. If anything, these sorts of factory towns have been disappearing. So in reality, this serf would have a number of employers to choose from, and these employers would be in a position of competition for his labor. Now, this assumes, of course, that he does have some sort of unique marketable skill that these people who are hiring would value. And this is why he's being sought after rather than any other general unskilled laborer. And if he is an unskilled laborer, then it's not the capitalist who is limiting his wage. It's the competition from other unskilled laborers who are in the same position that he's in. Furthermore, if he's in a position where there simply are no jobs available at even a subsistence wage, then that's obviously a tough situation, but it's not incumbent on any capitalist to provide a job for this guy or to support him just because he happens to be living in the same town as him. Right. And that doesn't mean that the capitalist might not provide some support to these people who can't get a job in the town. Certainly, there are social norms and social pressures for wealthy people within their communities to provide means of support for people who aren't as fortunate. But that's a different argument from saying that he should be compelled to give somebody a job when doing so could have the effect of making his business unprofitable, unviable, and ultimately go out of business, which isn't going to be good for anybody. And that sort of situation of compulsion is, is in fact the antithesis of a free contract. Yeah, this is what I really don't get about the anarcho-syndicalist position, is that it seems like you're trying to combat this so-called monopoly power of these capitalists by creating a bigger monopoly that just has more people in it. <laughs> but it still isn't everybody. I mean, it's like these individual kind of worker monopolies of each industry. But that leaves a lot of people out of the loop. And that group of people would still have to decide who they're hiring or who they aren't hiring. And guess what? If everybody in a company is voting on whether or not they should hire one more employee who might take a little bit of wage or, or job away from them, I'm guessing that's not going to go so well for people who are trying to break into that industry. You know, and of course, we see that in every union that's ever existed. Yeah, you see unions fighting for minimum wage laws, for child labor laws, for protectionism. And they paint a lot of these with these sort of noble ideals about earning a living wage and protecting children and supporting local industry. And I don't doubt that the people in these unions truly believe that stuff. But you don't have to be too cynical to follow the money and see some of the root causes for why these sorts of policies are supported. And it's all about propping up the existing union members at the expense of people who are outside of the union. Yeah, and we should say that there's nothing wrong with unions in theory. There's nothing wrong with workers getting together and trying to negotiate for some common goals. But historically, what we've seen is that unions tend to rely on government force to achieve their ends. And I think that in this kind of anarcho-syndicalist system, that that's the kind of result you would get. You would have these worker gangs kind of lording it over everybody else. There's a few other quotes from Chomsky that I want to mention here. He does go on to say, I should add, however, that I find myself in substantial agreement with people who consider themselves anarcho-capitalists on a whole range of issues. And for some years, I was able to write only in their journals. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Noam. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. The anarcho-capitalists put Chomsky on the map. <laughs> It'd be nothing without us. You know, I think that anarcho-capitalists are kind of interested in Chomsky, let's say. You know, obviously there's some disagreement here. But as he said here, I think there is some agreement here between some of our positions, especially when, he, when you get into things like his anti-war stances. And I think we can finish this off by asking Wainwright to reflect on another of Chomsky's quotes from the same interview. He says, Anarchism, in my view, is an expression of the idea that the burden of proof is always on those who argue that authority and domination are necessary. They have to demonstrate with powerful argument that that conclusion is correct. If they cannot, then the institutions they defend should be considered illegitimate. Good on you, Chomsky. You said it. <laughs> 
So there you go, Oliver Wainwright. The burden of proof is on you. Well, that article by Oliver Wainwright in The Guardian may have taken a bit of a passive-aggressive approach to subtly undermining and discrediting Schumacher's views. This next article eschews such subtleties. So we might dispense with the subtlety a bit here as we respond to some of the attacks in this piece. This article was written by Phineas Harper. It was published on DZine on November 28, 2016. The title of the article is, It is Time to Stop Listening to Patrick Schumacher. Okay, so let's stop right here at the headline. It's time to stop listening to Patrick Schumacher. So what Harper is arguing throughout this piece is that the media, and in particular architectural media outlets, are giving Patrick Schumacher a platform to spout his ideas and are therefore implicitly endorsing these ideas. So I've got a few friends on Facebook who you could probably call social justice warriors. And I was surprised at one point when one of these guys made a comment about how tolerance is bad and and I hate the word tolerance or something like that. And I was kind of shocked because I thought that was what the whole social justice thing was all about, was promoting tolerance of different ethnicities and cultures and all that sort of stuff. So that kind of threw me for a loop. And then a little while later, I read an article on fee.org about this guy named Herbert Marcuse, who was a philosopher in the sort of early to mid 20th century. He was a member of what's called the Frankfurt School and is arguably the godfather of kind of the new left movement, which Chomsky is sort of a part of as well. Marcuse wrote an essay in 1965 called Repressive Tolerance, and in this essay he argued for, quote, the withdrawal of toleration of speech and assembly from groups and movements which promote aggressive policies, armament, chauvinism, discrimination on the grounds of race and religion, or which oppose the extension of public services, social security, medical care, etc. So what he's advocating here is essentially what we're seeing now from these social justice warrior movements. And I would argue also from the alt-right, where the strategy they're using is not to put forward their own arguments and debate and hash out ideas, but simply to silence anyone who disagrees with them. Now, I'm no supporter of aggressive policies, armament, chauvinism, discrimination, but I don't think that simply trying to shut down people who are is a productive course of action. And this is very clearly evidenced by the growth of the alt-right as a reaction to what many people saw as an overreach of the social justice warriors and their tactics used when promoting this doctrine of political correctness by shutting down any sort of speech that they didn't like. Now, I think a much better course of action for any of these groups, regardless of what their actual ideology is, is if they think they do have better ideas, rather than trying to shut down the opposition, actually confront the opposition and put these ideas out there in debate. And if you have better ideas, then you shouldn't have any trouble winning those debates. Yeah, I agree that this technique of trying to shut down the opposition is ultimately not productive in the long run and can even be counterproductive. But I think it's worth saying here that when we talk about an anarcho-capitalist society and the way that certain behaviors get incentivized, we do get into discussions about things like ostracism and reputation and open public criticism of people and their ideas when those ideas are seen to be incongruent with a broader group of people. So I think that this strategy of trying to take away platforms and embarrass and ostracize and shut people down, I think it's fair game. But as you said, I just don't see it being a very viable and productive strategy over the long run. It's just going to breed resentment and probably get you vilified by anybody who doesn't agree to every single one of your specific talking points. So my guess is that a lot of these social justice warrior types aren't even aware of Marcuse and his writings. They've just been handed down these doctrines and strategies from their college professors or their friends or whoever. And I'm sure some of them have actually done some of the reading and some of the digging to understand their um, pedigree of thought. But it's interesting that Marcuse's ideas and writings are having so much effect 50 years after he wrote that essay, whether or not the people acting on those ideas are really aware that he exists. So first of all, before we get into the article, we talked about the picture in the Guardian article about Patrick in his parametric tuxedo that he designed himself and used that as an example of the kind of subtle digs that Oliver Wainwright had included in that article. Well, similarly, this article has a picture that sets the tone for the rest of the piece. I don't know where they got this picture from, but there's a picture of Patrick. It's kind of a close-up on his face. It's got harsh lighting, dark shadows. 
He's not smiling. He's got kind of a piece of hair out of place over his forehead. <laughs> Bit of stubble. Yeah, right. And I've seen this picture used in a few articles. And whenever I see it at the top of the article, it kind of indicates that I'm in for a hit piece. <laughs> so jumping into the article, here's a quote. Given a keynote lecture slot at the World Architecture Festival in Berlin, Schumacher unveiled an urban vision of hyper-exaggerated laissez-faire economics with total faith placed in the market to solve all conceivable problems. <laughs> so again here, he says Patrick has total faith in the market and it's going to solve all conceivable problems. Yeah. As we discussed earlier, this is just the nirvana fallacy. And Patrick has shown both in the Wainwright interview and in Tim's interview with him that he's by no means this sort of a dogmatist when it comes to the free market. These are just ideas that appeal to him and that he wants to explore. And whenever someone criticizes libertarians for having faith in the free market, what I wonder is, what's the alternative? What else are we supposed to have faith in? Politicians? Voters? Or is this about some sort of diversification of faith where you know, we'll give a little bit to the market, give a little bit to the politicians, a little bit to the voters, and just assume it'll all kind of work itself out? The reason that we have some faith in these free market ideas is the same reason that people have faith in science, because there are well-established tools and methodologies that can be used to make predictions within the limits of natural uncertainty and reasonability. <laughs> So here's another line. It came across like a satire of Hayekian economic theory, distorted to grotesque absurdity and applied without nuance to modern cities, except he meant it. <laughs> Actually, it just is Hayekian economics <laughs> and Misesian right. and Rothbardian. There's a whole 150-year tradition of thought here going back to Menger and arguably going back beyond Adam Smith to the Spanish scholastics, who had a pretty good understanding of the nature of money. And I think the reason he mentions Hayek in the first place is one, to try to show that he knows what he's talking about with some of this economic stuff, which I think is questionable. But also, I've noticed references to Hayek recently in the same way that people would use a reference to Ayn Rand or use the term neoliberal. And what it is is sort of a dog whistle to people who are opposed to free markets to signal that whoever they're talking about is part of the outgroup, that they're not one of us right-thinking people who cares about people and who cares about poor people. They're just Ayn Randian, neoliberal Hayekians who only care about greed and money and capitalism. I think in England in particular, Hayek is also strongly associated with Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism, for better or worse. At one point, I guess she actually held up a copy of Hayek's book, The Constitution for Liberty, and said, this is what we believe. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know a lot about Thatcher. I don't follow a lot of British politics. But Patrick does mention Thatcher in your interview with him. Yeah, Patrick mentioned that at the time he despised her, but now that he's come around to these more libertarian ideas, he's reflected on some of her efforts, and now he said he loves her. <laughs> and I think primarily there he's talking about her efforts to privatize industries that were previously government-run or heavily government-subsidized, things like the rail lines. Yeah, but I think it's worth mentioning that there's some controversy around Thatcher even among libertarians. While some libertarians might praise her for having kind of smashed the unions, the way she did this was by nationalizing the coal industry. And so that's not a very libertarian solution. So again, I don't know a lot about her. Uh, Tom Woods has recently done an episode about her, which we'll link to in our show notes. Yeah, this is a challenge that we libertarians always have, is that we try to find a shred of goodness in some of these politicians. <laughs> and it's often hard to do. I think a guy like Ron Paul was probably about as close as you can get to somebody who actually had a political impact while maintaining a very principled and libertarian approach to governance. And that's a rare thing. So again, I think with Thatcher, there's some good and there's some bad. I think Patrick probably respects the fact that she made these efforts to try to back down from government controls and government ownership and champion the idea that government shouldn't be the first response to every problem. Now, the success or failure of some of those actions can certainly be debated, but I agree that when politicians try to make efforts to start to roll back government, then they should be applauded. But of course, we should also criticize them when they fail to do that. Because after all, they're still just politicians. And getting back to the piece, Harper complains that he's applied this theory without nuance to modern cities. <laughs> now, I might suggest that if it's nuance that you want, maybe what you should do is actually listen to what he has to say and give him more time to speak, not less. <laughs> right. And go on his website, patrickschumacher.com. He's written thousands and thousands of words on these topics that are probably a little too nuanced for most people. 
And there's certainly a lot more to it than what you'll get out of a few bullet points from an hour and a half long presentation. Okay, next quote. His position is superficially eye-catching for its Katie Hopkins-like callousness, but is nothing more than a soundbite repeating the word market while Rome burns. Yeah, well, to be fair, that's probably how it does sound to someone who has absolutely no comprehension of his actual arguments. And I can relate. I mean, to me, when I'm hearing him talk about his architectural theories, which I really have no idea about, it just sounds to me like autopoesis, autopoesis, parametricism, semiology. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I'm not blaming Patrick for my ignorance here, (laughs) just because I haven't read his book. And who is Katie Hopkins? I don't know much about her, but apparently she's kind of like a British Ann Coulter. She's this kind of firebrand reporter who doesn't hold back and kind of makes sport of pissing people off on the left. It seems to me that he's doing almost the same thing that Wainwright was doing, where he's trying to sort of link Schumacher to the alt-right here. (laughs) Is that a fair call? Yeah, I think so. At least Harper didn't say Trump-like callousness. (laughs) And if you give Patrick's arguments the amount of attention to detail that Harper argues he deserves, then of course you're going to get nothing but sound bites. There's this other line here about repeating the word market while Rome burns. I think this is reflective of this mindset that if you're not talking about government solutions to problems, then you're not talking about solutions at all. That in order for there to be a solution to some societal problem, that government has to be involved. But of course, government is involved. It's heavily involved in the housing market in London. And the reality here is that because of all of these government interventions that Patrick has identified, it's London that's burning. And all these politicians aren't saving it. In fact, they're the ones with the matches. Moving on, Harper says, This September, at an Architecture Foundation debate, I saw Schumacher argue in favor of child labor, claiming that for under-18s to fulfill their potential in the marketplace, it is necessary to abolish laws which prevent kids from being put to work. Later, I saw him tell a recent graduate to her face that she would be doing better in life if her family had not claimed benefits during her childhood. So here we go with poisoning the well. So these are meant to be damning gaffes that Schumacher has made, revealing how cold-hearted he is, that he wants to put kids into sweatshops, take the food out of their mouths, and kick them out of their homes. So first of all, I had a job when I was, what, 13, delivering newspapers? Yep. And it was fantastic. I learned how to sell. I learned how to deal with customers. You learned how to be on time. (laughs) Yeah, I learned how to be on time and keep a schedule. And I learned the value of money, not to mention the personal satisfaction from having earned my own money without fully relying on my parents or someone else for pocket money. Yeah, well, I had to do your route a few times, you thankless bastard. (laughs) That's the only time I got complaints. (laughs) (laughs) And starting from when we were 16, Tim and I had summer jobs as furniture movers. So we were busting our butts carrying dressers up and down flights of stairs. And at the time, I think the two of us combined didn't even weigh 200 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were these scrawny little twerps that first summer and could barely lift a box. But you know what? By the time we were 18 and still doing that job, we were in pretty good shape. We were earning good money. And it was a great experience for us. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> I've still got lower back problems from that job. <laughs> yeah, but I got some free boxes out of it when I moved. I hope to encourage my own kids to find ways to make money. Now, I don't know if they'll be allowed to get a steady job because we can't have child labor, but hopefully they'll be able to come up with some sort of entrepreneurial venture or something like that, that they can earn a few bucks on under the table. Yeah, fundamentally here, I mean, putting the label of child labor on people who are under the age of 18 (laughs) is kind of disingenuous. And he doesn't give any context of where this comment of Patrick came from. But my guess is that he's talking about teenagers having the ability to work. Yeah, so God forbid kids should be able to earn a real paycheck before they are old enough to receive their first welfare check (laughs) when they turn 18 and they don't have any real world skills because they've never had a job. Yeah, honestly, I mean, the best time to get your first job is when you're still living with your parents and have no costs and aren't desperate for money to just support yourself. That gets back to this Chomsky idea. You have a lot more negotiating power when you're a teenager then you might once you're out on your own and have to support yourself and buy your own food and provide your own housing and transportation. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world for teenagers to get jobs. The next line here says, these are not the arguments of a wise man who understands society's ills and hopes to confront them. They are a dogmatic denial of reality, a fantasy that complex problems have simple solutions. So what kind of an argument is this? Let's have a look at some of these complex problems and the sort of solutions that are normally proposed for them. So for child labor, 
which I agree is a complex issue. The typical solution for this is for the government to prohibit it, meaning that they would punish and ultimately imprison any employer who hired a child under a certain age. Now to me, this sounds like a much more simple-minded solution to the slippery slope problem of child abuse or overworking children that is often associated with the term child labor. Now I think that an appropriately complex solution to this is to allow children to work if that's what they want and if that's what their parents want, and allow them to do so at a market price. And on the other hand, for people who want to oppose child labor, or at least the negative potential effects of child labor, there are means other than governmental prohibition that could be effective in combating this. Of course, the first is just to raise awareness of it. If there are any firms that are treating their workers badly, and that's, this is true whether it's children or, or adults, it's certainly fair game to try to publicize these things and possibly even to organize boycotts of that company. Nowadays, it's super easy to give any firm a complete PR nightmare if they're engaging in some practice that is viewed as abusive by some critical mass of people. But of course, these are much more complex approaches and complex solutions to the complex problem of child labor, which is why they seem so radical when, when people like us propose them, is because there is a simple solution out there of the government. So anybody who opposes government controls over child labor is viewed as supporting the potential negative practices that are sometimes associated with people under the age of 18 finding employment. And when you hear about these horrors of child labor and sweatshops and all that, this doesn't happen in the developed world. It happens in third world countries where people are completely impoverished and destitute, and they really do have no other options. London in 2017 is not the same London that you had in, in the 1800s when Dickens was writing about workhouses, which, by the way, were actually run by governments. Yeah, at that time, as the world was industrializing, people were moving from farms to cities to try to gain some economic advantage, which they saw these factories and workhouses as providing. So. The options they had were not between working at a dangerous loom all day or being a greeter at Walmart. You know, the options they had were working at a dangerous loom all day or working on a dangerous farm all day. If they were lucky. Yeah, if they actually had a farm to work on and where they had a lot less certainty about their income and what they would be able to produce. And the same thing is true nowadays with these third world countries where you have similar kind of industrialization happening is you have people moving from subsistence farming to more urban manufacturing areas in search of those kind of jobs. And in some of these places, some of those people are children. Again, the child's option isn't between working in the factory or going to school. The child's option is between working in the factory or working on the dangerous farm. Or more likely, just starving. So this raises the other complex issue that Harper mentioned, which is poverty and welfare. And more specifically, some of the second-order effects of people receiving welfare. So I imagine that this is what Patrick was getting at in this sort of hearsay quote that Harper refers to in the previous sentence, where he tells a student that she would have been better off if she hadn't received welfare during her childhood. So again, we have a typical solution that's offered for poverty, which is to provide welfare payments. And if those payments don't prove adequate to provide people with a sufficient standard of living, then we have another solution that's often applied, which is more welfare payments. And of course, this welfare money comes from taking money from other people via taxation, or by inflating the money supply, which of course makes goods and housing more expensive for everyone. Now again, I don't see this as a complex solution at all. I, <laughs> I see this as perhaps the most simplistic solution you could try. And it's one that has been tried, and it's one that has failed, or at least stagnated, over the last four or five decades. And again, I don't know exactly what the point was that Patrick was making in that debate, but there is this notion of grit, where people who grow up under hardship can develop characteristics of determination and certain kinds of risk-taking that can prove to be very beneficial later on in life. Now, of course, it's callous to try to make this a blanket statement about everyone who grows up in poverty, because obviously impediments are also impediments, and it's quite often more likely that someone who grows up in a state of poverty has a much more limited array of opportunities available to them. So if the simple solution is welfare payments or benefit payments taken under threat of force from other people, for people like us and like Patrick who reject the initiation of force by government as a means of trying to solve some of these problems, there are more complex solutions to try to alleviate poverty. First of all, we tend to believe that in a much more voluntary market with less government intervention, less taking of people's wealth, and without subsidization of certain pet industries, 
that the market itself would function much more efficiently and create a lot more opportunities for everybody up and down the socioeconomic ladder. And this is the trend that we have seen in some of the more free market oriented countries since the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, it's really the only approach that has been able to lift vast numbers of people out of poverty and provide a much higher standard of living for everyone in the society. And it's almost like clockwork that the more countries move away from a free market standard and try to rely on redistribution and transfer payments to help the poor, it takes a little while to wear down the level of productivity in the society, but over a few decades it does inevitably happen. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that a freer market would immediately solve everything. Of course, there will still be poverty, and there will be poverty really in, in any society, at least on relative terms. There will always be some people who are poorer and, and often much poorer than the majority of people within the society. So in any society, there's going to be a need for the more fortunate people supporting the less fortunate people. However, it's our contention that this could be done on a voluntary basis, essentially through various forms of charity. So in a free market society, there's going to be a need for charity and for charitable organizations to help those who are less fortunate. And I think that a problem we have now with government and especially government welfare payments is that everybody just assumes that even if they believe themselves to be a caring person, that they care about the plight of the poor and that they want to act in order to help these people, that they just default to the government, that an activist, a social activist, somebody who's acting on behalf of the poor, rather than putting their efforts into fundraising and direct benefits, they go out and they lobby governments and they protest for more governmental action to try to provide more transfer payments to the poor. So again, it's a simple solution that even the charitable organizations that could be most effective in creating some more sustainable systems of support for poorer people, their efforts are wasted on this simple solution of trying to grab more money through the government. So if you take government out of the charity business, and this is the kind of thing that sounds callous to some people, but it takes away that automatic impulse people have that, well, I don't need to do anything about it because the government is doing it. You know, my taxes pay for that. My taxes pay to support all these poor people. And if the government can't handle that, well, then, you know, the government's just not doing enough and they need to go take more money from people richer than me <laughs> to support more of these people. It becomes this crowding out effect, just like you see in any other industry where government monopolizes the industry, like in public schooling and the provision of infrastructure, where more robust market solutions don't present themselves because the government's already providing these things to everybody for free. And in the case of charity, they're providing a sense of charity, a sense of kind of social responsibility. They're providing that to people for free so that people's honest and innate need to feel like they're helping people less fortunate than themselves is subsumed by these government programs so that we don't have more robust forms of charity and of social support developing on the marketplace. And it's also important to note that charity is not the only way to provide wealth to the poor. And in this more voluntary society that we envision, because you would have more capital investment, higher worker productivity, and ultimately a much greater abundance of goods, this not only provides more high-paying jobs to a lot more people, but it also makes a lot more real goods available to society in general, which means that people who don't have a lot of money can achieve a much better standard of living on a much lower income. This is sort of the bright side of the Walmart effect, when people complain about how Walmart comes into a town and drives out all the mom and pop shops, and you could argue about whether or not this is a good thing. And I know that Walmart also does lots of lobbying to local governments and gets all these special privileges, okay, so I'm not going to dispute that. But there is this effect that Walmart has where they introduce into many of these communities a lot of cheap goods that allow poor people to improve their real standard of living. When you go into Walmart, it's not the rich people you see shopping there, it's the poor people. It's because that's where they can afford to buy more things. So when you look at complex issues like child labor, poverty, or any number of other issues that come up, I think you need to ask who's really confronting society's ills. Is it someone like Patrick who is trying to dig down to the root causes and exploring new ideas? Or is it someone who believes that the government fairy godmother will wave her magical truncheon and make problems disappear? Here's our next quote. The fact that the architecture world continues to give Schumacher airtime reveals the intellectual weakness of our profession, unable to see through the specious dogma. Are we really so cowed by fame that we lose all critical capacity when confronted with an outspoken starchitect? Evidently, yes, Phineas. You have lost all critical capacity. Next quote. 
Everyone loves to have a devil's advocate to stir things up, but the ideas behind Schumacherism are just the broken neoliberal position with go faster stripes and a spoiler. The time has come to change channel. It is time to stop listening to Patrick Schumacher. It is time to start listening to the Anarchitecture Podcast. So whenever you see someone criticizing libertarianism or anarcho-capitalism, and they bring up this neoliberal thing, for one thing, I think that's pretty much a UK or, or maybe European thing. And I think it's just because people in the US have been getting social media stuff from The Guardian and places like that. So they've picked up on this word neoliberal. But of course, in the US, liberal means almost the exact opposite of what it means in London. Yeah, that's right. I've found here that the word libertarian is kind of alien to people. They, don't, they have no idea what I'm talking about when I say I'm a libertarian. <laughs> they've never heard the word before. But the term neoliberal is probably the closest thing they have to the word libertarian. But it's also very much associated with Margaret Thatcher and Thatcherism. So when Harper talks about this as the neoliberal position with go faster stripes and a spoiler, I think he's probably hearkening back to the days of Thatcher where she did do some libertarian type of things like privatizing some industries and finding ways to reduce the influence of the welfare state. But as you mentioned earlier, she wasn't exactly a perfect libertarian either. Yeah, and I think that there's this common failure to distinguish between something like a Milton Friedman or an Alan Greenspan kind of one-way intervention to support corporations and to boost the stock market by providing tax breaks and maybe bailouts and, and other special benefits to prop up certain industries or businesses. Now, these get lumped in with the rolling back of government regulations on businesses. But the way we see it is that even if there are zero regulations on any industry, but there are some sort of these incentives or benefits in place to benefit certain industries or boost stock prices or business in general, then that's not a free market any more than it is if you have a heavily regulated industry with no benefits for corporations. So what we argue for is a complete absence of any government intervention in the market, whether it's assumed to increase economic activity or decrease economic activity. It has nothing to do with whether or not we support it. So I would identify this sort of pro-business interventionism as neoliberalism, or in the U.S. it might be something more like Chicago School monetarism or beltway libertarianism, as we sometimes call it. But I wouldn't call this the free market, and I wouldn't call it libertarianism, or certainly not anarcho-capitalism. Yeah, it's not just a difference of degree here, it's a difference in kind. And so this is a very common critique of free market ideas that demonstrate that the author really doesn't understand the libertarian position and fails to distinguish between this pro-business interventionist policy and a true free market position. The next quote, his proposals lack anything approaching a thoughtful interrogation of the real world. They are like the views of an extremist blinded by ideology, but given credence by a fawning architectural press. <laughs> uh, take a listen to the intro of our show and tell me how fawning you think that architectural press is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not like we've cherry-picked these two articles because they were the only ones out there that were saying anything bad about Patrick. <laughs> we chose the Wainwright article because we thought it was one of the ones that actually gave Patrick a bit of a chance, <laughs> despite the criticism that it contained. And even this article by Phineas Harper, we thought did a much better job of actually considering some of the arguments that Patrick was making, rather than just throwing out some cherry-picked quotes for people to be shocked by and, and find abhorrent. And even the articles we've found where people have defended him have generally made clear that they don't fully endorse Patrick's platform, and have been pretty cautious not to lump themselves in with Patrick. Yeah, I think some of the most positive responses to the speech have only gone so far as to say, well, you know, he may have a few points about some of the planning restrictions. And I respect his right to say what he's saying, even though I don't necessarily agree with it. You know, there has been nothing approaching a fawning architectural press, at least around <laughs> this issue. And even in the past, when talking about work of the firm, there have often been critical articles about Zaha Hadid and some of her projects, trying to drag up concerns about worker safety on the sites and projects going over budget. The firm has taken its fair share of blows over the years. But at the same time, they have produced some pretty remarkable architecture. So yes, of course, the architectural press is going to promote and support their work at some points, but that has not been uniform. So suggesting that the architectural press just fawns all over everything that Zaha Hadid Architects puts out is, I think, an overstatement. And if you're talking about the reaction that the press has had to Patrick's speech, it's the exact opposite of what has happened. Yeah, I mean, the whole reason this has become a big news story is because it's so controversial. And the architectural press has had a field day with it trying to paint Patrick as some sort of extremist blinded by ideology. 
what do they say, if it bleeds, it leads, right? So by all means, if you can find any articles that have put forward his views for any purpose other than to attempt a ham-fisted hit piece like this one, we're all ears. Okay, so at this point in the article, the well has been sufficiently poisoned, just like it was in the Wainwright article before this. So now the time has come for the first actual argument. Harper writes, It is on economics where Schumacherism really falls apart. Ben Clark, a London-based urban designer whose paper on funding new cities was awarded a Wolfson Economics Prize by the Right of Center Think Tank Policy Exchange, takes a dim view. So this is a quote from Ben Clark. It's economically illiterate, argues Clark. If laissez-faire politics is his thing, Patrick Schumacher should try learning from the likes of Adam Smith, godfather of the free market, with the free market in quotes. Smith never saw the, quote, invisible hand of the market working alone and had a sophisticated understanding of the role of the state. In his seminal text, The Wealth of Nations, Smith recommends using some of the rents within cities to pay for public services, for example. Simply privatizing and deregulating absolutely everything down to the last park and street, as Schumacher proposes, is sheer market fundamentalism and will only intensify our current crisis, unquote. Okay, so this one requires a little bit of breaking down. So here we have an appeal to authority. And in order to establish this authority, we learn that Clark won a prestigious economics prize. And it's from a right of center think tank. So, you know, this guy should be on Patrick's side, right? Right, because the Wolfson guys must be neoliberals too, right? I guess so. So I dug into this a little bit. And as it turns out, in 2014, the Wolfson Economics Prize was awarded for an innovative proposal to expand garden cities to provide more housing throughout England. But this is not the award that was given to Ben Clark. Clark did win an award in this competition. However, it was a 1,000 pound, quote, light bulb award. So it's a little bit disingenuous to tout him as the winner of a Wolfson Economics Prize. I mean, okay, he got a participation ribbon. And so this is what Harper uses to establish Clark's bona fides as a right of center expert on economics from within the architecture world. Now, Clark's proposal for this contest was an idea to crowdfund the development of a new garden city, which, if you ask me, actually sounds like something that Schumacher might be interested in. Yeah, that sounds like the kind of thing we get behind. Exactly. We should have him on the show. But I hardly think that this constitutes some sort of PhD in the history of economic thought. I mean, yeah, it's a good idea, but, you know, I read Wikinomics too. Okay, so whatever. I mean, maybe Clark isn't an expert in the the history of economic thought, (laughs) but Clark kind of does a smart thing here in his quote. Within this appeal to authority to Clark, he appeals to another authority, which is Adam Smith. (laughs) (laughs) So we have an appeal to authority inside an appeal to authority. (laughs) Yeah, this is kind of like uh, like Inception, like a dream within a dream, right? (laughs) (laughs) It makes just about as much sense. (laughs) Now, the argument Clark makes is that the entire premise of free market economics is invalidated by the fact that Adam Smith wasn't an anarchist. The title of his book was Wealth of Nations. That should give you some idea of that. Yeah. If you take a broader view of the history of economic thought, Adam Smith was just a flash in the pan. What he did do was to popularize many of the ideas that were floating around at the time from guys like the French physiocrats and Cantillon and Turgot, as well as some other Scottish intellectuals. We and Patrick subscribe to the Austrian School of Economics, which is a particular school of thought within free market economics that has developed throughout the 19th and 20th century. So for an Austrian perspective on Adam Smith, we can look to Murray Rothbard's two-volume comprehensive history called An Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought. He has a chapter on Adam Smith here, and we'll link to an excerpt from it, where he says, and this is Rothbard talking about Adam Smith, the problem is that he originated nothing that was true and that whatever he originated was wrong. That, even in an age that had fewer citations or footnotes than our own, Adam Smith was a shameless plagiarist, acknowledging little or nothing and stealing large chunks, for example, from Cantillon. For Smith not only contributed nothing of value to economic thought, his economics was a grave deterioration from his predecessors, from Cantillon, from Turgot, from his teacher Hutchison, from the Spanish scholastics, even oddly enough from his own previous works, such as the lectures on jurisprudence and the theory of moral sentiments. For the much-revered Wealth of Nations is a huge, sprawling, inchoate, confused tome, rife with vagueness, ambiguity, and deep inner contradictions. And he concludes, It is possible to derive varying and contradictory interpretations from various, or even the same, parts of the book. So the point to make here is that the field of economics has a much broader spread than what you'll find in Adam Smith. Most importantly, with the marginal revolution, which came about in the late 1800s, 
led by Valera, Jevons, and Karl Menger, who's really the founder of the Austrian school. Ben Clark called Schumacher economically illiterate. So if Ben Clark thinks that Adam Smith is the ultimate authority on what constitutes a free market, it makes me wonder how economically illiterate is Ben Clark. <laughs> Let's move on to the next quote that we have here from the Harper article. Harper says here about Schumacher, he claims the market can produce vibrant, fulfilling neighborhoods while unable to articulate how it is that, as Owen Hatherley has shown in a recent We Made That newspaper, it's a quote from Owen Hatherley, quote, left to themselves, particularly when given nearly unlimited space, what developers will do is provide low-rise housing, retail parks, car parks, and shopping malls with public space between, at the very best, an afterthought. So here we have another appeal to authority. So let's go through it again. Who is Owen Hatherley? Well, I looked for this article, this We Made That newspaper, where he made this assertion about how developers will act given nearly unlimited space. And I couldn't find that. As far as I can tell, We Made That is an architectural and urban design firm here in the UK. And they appear to have some publications on their website, but I couldn't find a newspaper. So I wasn't able to find this article to get the context for this quote. But Owen Hatherley is an architectural writer here in the UK. He writes for The Guardian and for a number of other architectural and mainstream media outlets. And just to give some perspective here, he actually has a Wikipedia page. And this is a quote I took from the page on Wikipedia. It says, Hatherley has described himself as a communist, quote, at least in the sense in which the word was used in the Communist Manifesto. He wrote that, quote, revolution might be a rather exciting thing, one that would transform the world and transform space for the better. Worth doing. Why not try it? Um, I think that has been tried. A few times. Didn't go so well. Yeah, look, I mean, okay, so this guy's got a bias, you know, he's got a point of view, a fairly radical point of view, which I actually respect. You know, I, of course, we have a radical point of view kind of on the other end of that spectrum. And so I'm not going to be too harsh on him, you know, just because he happens to subscribe to a, an economic theory that is deeply flawed and has no appreciation of actual economic cause and effect, as it has repeatedly proven through decades of mass murder and impoverishment of millions of people in certain places around the world. But, you know, why not try it? So again, you read that back into his statement about how these greedy developers will just provide, you know, crap development. Of course, there's nothing here to back that up. And as I said, I can't find the original article to give that context. But at face value, it it certainly sounds like the kind of knee-jerk response you would expect from someone who pines for the halcyon days of authoritarian control by communist governments. Uh, Come on, Tim, that's not fair. He might be an anarcho-syndicalist. So ignoring the bias, let's take his argument at face value. Is he arguing that retail parks, car parks, and shopping malls aren't public spaces? Because the last time I went to a shopping mall, I couldn't find a place to park. There were that many people there. Right. It's funny, you know, the people who sometimes say that they're championing the causes of the workers and the poor and the less fortunate, they're completely tone deaf to the way that many of these people actually live. The people who are going to malls and to retail parks, and as we said, to Walmart, these are amenities, public space amenities, that many of these people seek out. There's this elitist idea that poor people just want to kind of hang around in public parks all day. And have quiet places to contemplate in the middle of the city. But of course, those are the kind of spaces that architects and architecture critics want to see, right? We all want these big, beautiful cities. But the reality is that many people just want to have a place where they can go, where they can find a place to park their car, they can go and get their groceries, you know, they can go and do some shopping. You know, you get an Orange Julius, you get a Cinnabon, maybe later you get diabetes. <laughs> but I mean, this is what these people want. This is what they're seeking out. Uh, so whenever I hear architecture critics like this criticizing this kind of suburban development, and again, there are problems with suburban development, but it's more this, this suburban kind of a lifestyle that people just want to get in their car and go places and have everything kind of spoon fed to them in these prepackaged environments. I mean, I don't really have a problem with that. If that's the life that people want, then they can have it. Who's being the populist here? Yeah, and it's these developers who are reading the market signals and responding to these preferences to provide the spaces that people actually want. And there is really no comparable price mechanism to signal demand for parks or other sorts of public spaces. But this is because everyone expects that the provision of these kind of public spaces is the government's job. So this is a perfect example of the Hayekian calculation problem, where the heavy intervention of the government completely eliminates any sort of market pricing system And therefore, it's not even considered by private developers. Yeah, and frankly, I think this is kind of a straw man argument to begin with. 
certainly there are many examples of private developments that do incorporate green space. I mean, you go into any condominium development in the United States, and there's often plenty of green space. Joe, you had a condo like this, where you had all these condominiums kind of developed around the central green area in between all of them. Yep. And not just that, but then between other group of buildings, there's often green spaces as well. You know, as well as, as trees, you know, planted areas. Swimming pools, tennis courts. Yeah, sure. All of these amenities. And these amenities are provided because this is something that, depending on the type of development, that people might want and that they might use to attract people to that development. So I think the, the claim that private developers don't provide public space First of all, you need to be clear and broad-minded about what public space is. And second, I think this is blind to the observation that there are many developments that provide a lot of public space. And just one last point here. He had a little line in here that in his scenario, the developers were given nearly unlimited space. And of course, this isn't what any of us are talking about. There's always limited space. And of course, anybody developing unlimited space is going to develop that differently than some kind of constrained urban space. You're not going to have an unlimited space and build a high rise in the middle of that and leave the rest as parkland. In fact, of course, you know, they tried a lot of that in the 1950s and 1960s. Didn't go so well. Okay, let's move along to the next quote here from Phineas Harper. He says, now again, talking about Patrick, he is adamant that the market can never make mistakes, but fails to acknowledge the total market failure leading to the 2008 crash. Now, it's interesting here that Harper hasn't actually linked to anything supporting this supposed view that Patrick holds that markets can never make mistakes. That he's adamant about it. He's adamant about it. You know, you think it would be pretty easy to support that with any of the thousands and thousands of words that Patrick has written. The reason to promote markets is not that they can't make mistakes, but it's that they have natural feedback mechanisms that make the mistakes visible to the people who are making decisions. And the cost of those mistakes are brought to bear on the people who made the mistakes, on the producers who misjudged demand or who squandered their resources. So when mistakes are made in markets, the person who's made the mistake loses money and is in a much weaker position to continue making further mistakes. Now governments, on the other hand, when they make mistakes, usually what happens is they end up throwing more money at the same department, which they think will somehow allow them to dig themselves out of the hole they've made. But of course, they end up making the same mistakes over and over again and just digging that hole deeper. And this is because governments really have little or no feedback to give them the sort of signals that entrepreneurs have in the markets. When we do see widespread market failure, as we did in the 2008 crash, this is almost certainly the direct result, not of the fact that the market is unregulated, but the fact that the market is heavily interfered with by governments. And this is exactly what happened in the 2008 stock market crash. Yes, there were market mechanisms that exacerbated some underlying conditions, that were leading to a housing boom and all of the financial instruments that were fabricated around that. But all of these things, the financial instruments, the housing boom itself, and the amount of money that was floating around within the market resulted from government policies, including Federal Reserve policies, to keep interest rates low, to encourage home buying and home lending, especially to more and more risky borrowers, and to protect the financial institutions who were taking these inordinate risks that ultimately led to their collapse. And, you know, everybody makes this out to be like, you know, nobody saw this thing coming in 2008. You know, there's this movie, The Big Short, which is a pretty good movie about this whole situation that makes it seem like there were like maybe four or five people in the world who anticipated this crash coming in the housing market and then the subsequent stock market. But actually, Joe, Joe, didn't you get an email from somebody like a month after the stock market crash that kind of spelled out like why the whole thing had happened and and all the government interference that had caused it? Did you who, 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 who sent that to you? Do you remember? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I can't remember which economist that was that I received that email from. Oh, oh, no, no, yeah, I remember who it was. It was, uh, it was me. Oh, yeah, that guy. I sent that to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So here I was, you know, at the time, a lowly intern architect, and apparently I was one of the five people in the world who was able to predict the 2008 crash. And as I say that, I was actually in cash at the time. I didn't have a whole lot of money in the investment markets, but I did have a 401k, and I had pulled my money completely out of the market as of, I think, March of 2008. So when the crash came in September of 2008, I didn't really lose anything. Well, you could have sent me that email a few months earlier, you bastard. (laughs) You wouldn't have believed me. No one would have believed me. (laughs) Cassandra. And honestly, I don't want to make this out to be more than it was. I mean, I wasn't certain that this was going to happen, but even as far back as 2005, when I was really starting to get into these ideas of Austrian economics, and paying attention to some of the things that Austrian commentators on the financial markets were saying, they were all over this housing bubble, even before it was a bubble, or even before the bubble started turning down, which really happened around, I think, 2006. 
These guys looked at what the Federal Reserve was doing with the interest rates. They looked at what the government was doing in promoting home ownership and home lending. And they looked at some of these financial instruments that were being created, like mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations, and credit default swaps, and realized that this whole thing was a ticking time bomb. And this was years before the actual crash. And so, yeah, so about a month after this crash happened, I kind of wrote a bunch of thoughts down. I sent, I think I called it the article Explaining the Economy to Dad, because my father and I had had a conversation about it, (laughs) I think about a week before that. And then I sent it to you and, and, and to my dad, and that's probably about as far as it went. <laughs> but at, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll post that up on our site and link to it here. So anybody who has acknowledged the, quote, total market failure leading to the 2008 crash might want to take a look at that and understand what really went wrong. And if you want a more detailed understanding of that 2008 crash, check out Tom Wood's book, Meltdown, or David Stockman's The Great Deformation. And you know what? My guess is that Schumacher has read both of those books. I know I read Meltdown. He said that was actually one of the things that catalyzed him to start looking at these ideas in the first place. Harper closes the article by saying, It is Schumacher himself who seems to have the most healthy attitude to his own ideas. Quote from Schumacher. I'm not certain about what I'm saying, he admits, but I think these arguments are worth floating. Unquote. It is high time the architecture world took away the armbands and let them sink. So he's adamant, yet he's not certain. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So this is the same thing that Wainwright did, where he spends a whole article talking about how Patrick is this unwavering ideologue who's trying to shove these ideas down everyone's throats. And then again, when he explains that he's just proposing theories for discussion, Harper takes that and throws it back in his face. So just to recap, the whole point of Harper's article here is to argue that these controversial ideas should be silenced and that nobody should be giving them an outlet. Now, what's interesting is that in Harper's bio, it says that he's a member of a debate society called Turncoats, which actually prides itself on debating controversial topics and challenging orthodoxy. Now, it seems to me that any one of Schumacher's ideas would be a great topic for the society which Harper's involved in to debate. I mean, why not? Why not get Schumacher out there? Why not get Tim out there? Get him up on stage and and hash this stuff out. And if you're willing to come to Australia, you could even get me. So again, with both of these articles, we just want to reiterate that the reason we've selected these articles is that we found that they were actually some of the better ones out there that were critical of Patrick. So even though we've joked around a little bit and been pretty critical of these articles, we're not really trying to do any sort of ad hominem character assassination on these authors. What we hope to do is to encourage them and their readers to recognize that there is a much broader world of ideas out there than what they've been exposed to. And if you're going to take the time to write a hit piece about someone, you can have much more effective arguments by actually understanding what their position is and presenting it honestly before presenting your own criticisms of their actual arguments rather than this sort of ad hominem straw man stuff. You know, Patrick has said, and we've said on this show, that even though we disagree with many of these people about the means of achieving some of their ends, I think there is some agreement on the ends we're trying to achieve. We're all trying to provide, as Patrick's speech was entitled, housing for all, housing for everyone. We just have a different means of trying to achieve that end, and in our view, one that has a moral advantage of not relying on the initiation of force by governments. In the next episode, episode 11, you'll get to hear Patrick in his own words talk about parametricism, his theoretical work in architecture, as well as some of his political ideas. And so contrary to silencing him, if you actually sit down and listen to what he has to say, I think you'll find that his heart is in the right place here. And he's talking very pragmatically about approaches to solving social problems that are outside of the status quo, and yes, possibly even extreme, 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 extreme. would like to order an extra large orange julius and an original flavor cinnabon 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 um you want it to go back so you can eat it in your car yeah what take that capitalism anarcho-syndicalism rules <laughs> mm.
I wish to render this transaction null and void, sir. My views have been irrevocably changed by this courageous act of anonymous vandalism, and I now recognize that the very exchange of goods for money is an affront which no society should be made to suffer. I, Winston Churchomsky, heretofore declare myself an anarcho-syndicalist. Good fun. Uh, that guy didn't pay for his Cinnabon. <laughs>